Okay. Uh, welcome to the first uh, committee meeting of the Finance Committee for this year. Uh, can I ask the Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for agenda items? And if members are content to agree, the revised order of the agenda items is indicated at page three of your table papers. Thank you. Great. We move and proceed through the agenda. Uh, first of all, apologies. Melissa's um, sort of offered his apologies. Uh, there are no further apologies. Gemma, in accordance with temporary standing order 115, uh, you are delegated to vote on his behalf. Are you content? Yeah. Happy for that. Uh, declarations of interest. Remind members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest to the committee applicable. Any declarations of interest? Yep. Uh, I'd like to start off with the oral evidence, and I'd like the could we bring the minister up on uh, starlight or on spotlight, please? I wanted to say starlight. So, just assembly broadcasting. If you could bring um, uh, Minister Connor Murphy and uh, official Joanne McBurney uh, into the spotlight. Thank you. So if you just start speaking, we'll come into the middle. So that okay, Connor, good to see you. Can you hear us? I think he's muted. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Happy New Year to you again. And on behalf of the committee, we wish you and the department a very good new, new year. And we look forward to working with you closely in this most interesting of times. I also thank you for uh, meeting with me and the Deputy Chair on Monday, and I think that was very useful. And we understand the circumstances around the budget, or the Chair and the Vice or the Deputy Chair. I do, but I think it's appropriate, as we said on Monday, that you get a chance to talk to the committee, so the committee are aware of the circumstances and where we are. And there's a few things that obviously have come up today, particularly in relation to the voucher scheme and how that's been managed and looked at as well. I think it would be appropriate for us as the Finance Committee to get your view on so we understand what is happening along those situations. But uh, sorry, over to you, Connor, and uh, if you can sort of give the committee, committee a briefing as required. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for the welcome and Happy New Year to yourselves and the committee and the staff. Uh, I have Joanne McBurney, as you said, uh, on the, the line with me as well, uh, and she will, of course, as always. Be able to pick up on any of the detail of the, the questions that you're asking uh, uh, in relation to that. Uh, I'm obviously delighted to be able to get a chance to talk to you. I I would have preferred if we were talking through the detail of a draft budget paper, which you would have had sight of uh, at this stage. But that hasn't been the uh, hasn't been able to be the case. I did first table the draft budget paper. Uh, I think. Uh, the 9th, 10th of December, uh, and it only really, after a number of uh, attempts to get it onto the executive agenda, it only made it on yesterday for a discussion, which I think is, is uh, I mean, I was happy to have some progress in that regard. Uh, I wanted to have the opportunity to uh, have an engage with other executive ministers back and forth because all of them would have seen the first iteration of the draft budget paper back, back then in December, and, and quite a few of them obviously have been in communication with me back and forth by by letter and by contact through department officials. So it was the first opportunity we had yesterday to discuss the budget and the uh, intention. And I sincerely hope this is the case that it goes back to tomorrow morning's uh, or tomorrow's executive meeting uh, for uh, approval so that we can get the consultation launched. You will know, uh, Chair and the Deputy Chair, as I said to you on uh, uh, on, on Monday when we met, we, we, we have a limited time frame in terms of consultation. Uh, due to the fact that we only got uh, an announcement of the end of the comprehensive spend review on the 25th of November. Uh, and then we have to wait a further 14 days before the Secretary of State will confirm what our funding envelope is. And I'll come back to some aspects of that perhaps when we, uh, in later remarks. Uh, and so it was really uh, early the first week in December where we were able to put together a paper and, and bring it to the executive. Uh, and that's a limited time frame for consultation uh, with yourselves, with other committees to have a look at that and talk to their departments in relation to it and for other stakeholders who obviously have keen interest in the budget in the time ahead. And the fact that we uh, are only able to hopefully get it clear tomorrow, uh, and I will intend to release a written statement tomorrow if we can get cleared and come up to the Assembly on Monday. I hope to do an oral statement if we get approval tomorrow. Uh, but it still is a shorter time frame for consultation than I would have liked to have. I think than people genuinely would have expected to have. Uh, and so I'm disappointed that we've had this hiatus and delay in getting the budget paper into the executive. But I'm hoping tomorrow we conclude 
that process. As you know, we were hoping for and we were told to expect over the course of the comprehensive spend review, which initially was to have taken place over the summer, uh, was pushed back because of COVID into the autumn. Uh, but we were told uh, throughout that process to operate on the basis that we would be getting uh, a multi-annual budget uh, process at the end of it, which is clearly what we want. And I know from talking to the committee yourselves that that's something that, that you want as well. But uh, we, we really just received a fairly abrupt announcement at the end of that process that we were into an annual pro budget process again. It falls short as well in terms of what we would anticipated uh, in terms of the level of finance available to us in the budget. Uh, and I, I think essentially, and, and we'll get into some of the detail on that, on that because it's, it's, it's publicly known, uh, when there was an addition, uh, an additional amount, a uh, marginal additional amount, uh, but bear in mind we got 350 million NDNA money uh, into this year's budget at the start of the financial year. And so when that was taken out of it again, then that left the increase in the budget as to be very marginal indeed. So in essence, uh, what it has created is, if you like, a standstill uh, uh, budget for all of the departments. Uh, and given the time frames we were operating to, given that the comprehensive spend review uh, ran on, then I think that it didn't really allow for us uh, to begin uh, uh, any significant reprioritization exercise across departments. Of course, there would be winners and losers in that when you were operating from a standstill basis. Uh, but I, I think in communication and consultation, with executive ministers, there didn't seem to be much appetite for a reprioritization exercise. And I think we would have been very constrained in time wise in terms of what we could have done. So, we, we essentially means that all of the departments are living within the baselines that they had last year. Uh, that's, uh, the, that's in the draft budget proposition, and uh, that might uh, change or alter if there's a significant feedback over the course of the budget consultation. But that's my proposal. Uh, will be my proposal to the executive to uh, to effectively operate within those baselines. There are a couple of big strategic issues that we want to put on the committee's agenda uh, for the budget, and I obviously can't go into detail on the figures until such times as it's approved by the executive. Uh, and I hope, as I say, to be able to issue a written statement tomorrow, even if we do get approval and come to the assembly on Monday. And I'm, of course, happy uh, to. I'm sure officials will be back in front of the committee in due course to uh, to answer questions or, or myself if the committee so requires. Uh, but the big, some of the bigger strategic issues to consider are rates. Um, there is a balance between generating income for public services, particularly in the, in the case where we've effectively received a flat budget. Um, but there's also, uh, as you will know, and the members will know, uh, the emergence from the pandemic, the, the difficult, very, very difficult and challenging economic situation we're in uh, and the effect that that has on households as well. Uh, so uh, I think that's one of the issues that we have had to consider, and I made a proposition to uh, executive colleagues in relation to that, uh, which I'd be happy to share with the committee when the, the papers approved. And the other, other issue is in, in a situation where and I know a, a number of committee members over the course of the year, when I've been in the chamber, have asked me questions in relation to this. But in, in the context where we are. Uh, having essentially a flat budget where we're trying to stimulate some form of economic uh, growth again or uh, economic recovery of the, uh, as we hopefully will begin to emerge from the pandemic then they, they need to stimulate uh, capital investments and the the, uh, the economic activity that will generate in terms of construction then the question arises in terms of the access to RRI borrowing and as the members will know we have access to about 200 million pounds of our I borrow in a year, uh, and so I think uh, I would I put a proposition to the executive in relation to that, uh, and it's something that I hope they will support. We had a, a discussion about that issue yesterday at the executive meeting, but I think it's it's a big strategic issue that needs to be considered, and it's, I think it's something the committee will want to look at whenever ever we can get the paper to you. So I'm hoping, as I said, Chair, just by way of opening remarks, uh, that we we have uh, we will get some certainty and clarity tomorrow. Uh, as I say, I was uh, happy at least to get the paper off for discussion yesterday. Uh, I would have wished that we had this paper discussed, agreed out the door in December. Uh, at this stage, we would have had, even with the Christmas break, uh, at least a, a number of weeks to allow people to begin to engage with it. Uh, but we are where we are. And uh, I say hopefully tomorrow uh, and next week, then we'll be in the Assembly to take some questions and do some further elaboration on it. So, Connor, just to just to kick it off, um, and thanks very much indeed for that. Um, just going over the timeline. So, if you get the executive approval to sign off tomorrow and you issue a statement tomorrow, 
Uh, so, and we start the, and therefore we start the consultation process. Um, it's going to be extremely tight to get the round through the necessary committees and get the proper scrutiny and the rest of it. And I think one of the concerns we'll have is that um, you know we would. I'm not so sure that we'd be minded to be granting accelerated passage because we do need to scrutinise this and look at look at this very carefully. So could you give me a quick outline of how you look at the timings then, if we do get it through tomorrow? Well, I think uh, the, the, in one of the earlier introductions we had a seven-week timeline, I think that's now reduced again somewhat. So uh, I think you could be into somewhere roughly in around six weeks. I think we do need to be into the assembly by the end of February, probably uh, at the latest early March, uh, to start to, to put it through this. Now, it's committees, uh, of course, prerogative in terms of how they view a request for accelerated passage, but uh, obviously we, we the budget needs to be done and registered for uh, by the end of the financial year. I think the 31st of March is the deadline, which we just managed to meet last year uh, because we were only back in office, obviously, uh, around this time last year. So there is a, a tight time frame. Uh, it's tighter than I would have wanted it to be. It already was constrained by the comprehensive spend review and their timetable shifting into the autumn. Uh, but uh, and it's not obviously not anywhere near ideal, but that's the time frame we're working to. Okay. Um, second one, Connor. Look, we've noticed today in the media it's been uh, it's been pushed that the voucher scheme, the Department of Economy's voucher scheme, the ninety eight million pounds has been moved into next year. And uh, as far as we had been aware there, was, there, there hadn't been any flexibility for shifting um, sort of funds into the following year. So, has the Treasury agreed to the shifting of that 98 million? And if they're agreeing to that, what else are they like? Have you had any discussions with any other sort of flexibilities they've discussed? Well, we, we've been pressing for flexibility. Uh, uh, we have uh, obviously had now with the additional 200 million that was announced just before Christmas, that takes us up to three billion pounds of additional money, uh, COVID-related money that we've had to spend over the year. And there's a challenge in doing that, uh, uh, particularly because it, you know the 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 impact of the virus and, and, and people being able to work together that has been challenging. Uh, getting schemes quickly out onto the ground, uh, getting uh, you know getting the the necessary cleared and, and the number of people uh, into them, uh, and there still are gaps there, which I think the executive and executive colleagues need to try and address the time in. So that we challenge. So we have been pressing Treasury for flexibility uh, in relation to this this money. We have some very limited flexibility. Ordinarily, in terms of some aspects of the the uh, finances available to the executive, but it is a very limited amount. Uh, I think there is a recognition. Uh, I know Joanne and other officials have been talking to Treasury. There is a recognition that money which has come really late in the year, like that two hundred million pounds, and if there is anything else to come, which is a possibility between now and the end of financial year, that I think Treasury probably would be prepared to carry in some of that over. Uh, but we've no certainty in relation to that. Or we just have, I feel like, the kind of vibes that we're getting. I am in the process of uh, agreeing a letter with the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister to jointly press for as much flexibility as we can get. Because not only is there a difficulty in spending out, and I've been encouraging all departments to spend out the money they've been getting, to surrender very quickly and to try and find ways to use this money to as its best possible effect in the short time frame we have left in the end of this financial year. Uh, but we have a very challenging budget situation next year. So the more that we would be able to carry over into next year, then at least it will uh, manage to ease some of the pressures that departments undoubtedly will face next year. So we are not only pressing ourselves in terms of our interests here, uh, but we're jointly doing an exercise with Scotland and Wales to try and press for as much flexibility as we can. I, I, I did hear the announcement uh, today in relation to the voucher scheme. I know there has been... Uh, some, there have been some difficulties in, in, in trying to get that put together, and obviously the longer the restrictions roll on, then the tighter the time frame for spending out that is. But uh, we have no guarantees in terms of carry over. But we know we have some COVID money for next year, uh, and we will hope uh, and, and have, I suppose, reason to be optimistic that we will get some carry over in relation to some of the COVID money this year. And of course, we will try if that's the executive's will. Uh, to meet uh, schemes which people want to see in place for next year, but uh, that's all a matter for further discussion. All right. So just to get it clear, the Treasury haven't approved the carryover of the 98 million. What we're doing is reprofiling that 98 million into monies that we're ex additional monies we might be expecting to come from COVID. 
Well, they haven't, they haven't approved that specific project. What we've been pressing them on is, in the general terms, late money that we have received uh, in relation to COVID, including that 200 million that we got prior to Christmas. We have uh, indicated to us a COVID allocation next year of around half a billion which is significant, but is much less, obviously, when you measure it against the three billion that we received this year. Uh, and so we know we have some COVID money next year uh, to deal with COVID issues. Uh, and we hope to have some carry over and release some of that uh, from this year as well. But uh, quite a lot of that COVID money for next year will be earmarked for, for health, for education. Uh, there will be some of it left, I think. Uh, so whether we can accommodate the, the voucher scheme in, in that, obviously, it's going to be a matter for the executive. Uh, but there's no specific uh, approval for carryover at all. Uh, and uh, we haven't uh, been pressing the issue specifically in relation to that voucher scheme because we really only got a sense today that it was going to, uh, not going to be at least partially spent out within this year. Okay, um, and just two others, Connor. Um, basically, on a flat cash budget that you're proposing, particularly when it comes to health and education, who have got sort of substantial um, sort of resource implications that are based around sort of pay rises and pay rises that they will there will be definite expectation to achieve. But the other issue, of course, is within health is the agenda for change, which is an NDNA commitment. And I wonder, on a flat cast basis, how we're, how we're going to achieve that within the within the with the totals that we have. Well, it's, it's undoubtedly going to be very challenging. It's not the budget that we wanted, uh, and we have made that very clear to Treasury uh, that it's not the budget that we wanted. We firstly wanted we wanted a multi-annual budget uh, and be able to to chart our spend over the time again and allow for more strategic planning, but. Uh, uh, so it's certainly not what we had wanted. The NDNA commitments were, are ones we will continue to follow up, uh, which are separate. Um, they're done now through the, the Northern Ireland office, uh, and we haven't had clarity around that from the Secretary of State. So we haven't been able to include that in the budget paper, the draft budget paper, but we are, it is our, our clear intention and hope that we'll be able to get clarity around those and include them in the final budget paper, alongside some costs of the protocol from the Treasury as well, which I think need to be included in the final budget paper. So there are, there are a few elements missing, uh, including the NDNA commitments, because we have to have confirmation from the Secretary of State uh, in relation to them. But in terms of the overall uh, uh, position for, uh, as you say, big spending departments like health and education, this is going to be very, very challenging. Okay, thanks, Dr. Um, Matthew, you're going to ask a question about RRI? Okay, that's fine. I won't bother. No, that's that's fine, fine Connor. Um, Jim? Yep. A uh, couple of points. Um, first of all, could I just uh, place on record my thanks to DFP staff uh, for handling the coronavirus grants in recent weeks? I understand that over £100 million has been given out, and whilst, of course, there were a few delays, things are beginning to move, and... Uh, those have kept many businesses afloat in a terribly difficult time. So uh, well done to the staff responsible for that. Secondly, just going back to the Chair's comments, uh, to the chronology of this, if you get agreement with the Executive uh, tomorrow, will there be a statement to the House on Monday? H how are you going to, to, to address this issue? Or it, will it be done by means of a matter of the day? H how exactly are we going to hear on Monday, what's happening? Just, and then I'll move on to the other questions. Well, firstly, Jim, and I, I thank you for the commentary uh, around the staff. And uh, there was, as you know, and, and members will know because I have a lot of communication from them, uh, there were teething issues in relation to getting some of that, and, and, and still remain some uh, outstanding issues in relation to the LRSS grants. But MPS staff have worked incredibly hard uh, to not only try and get that money out the door, but also to deal with the the understandable inquiries and, and uh, concerns raised that people waited to find out whether they were in the scheme or not. And uh, over £100 million, pounds, that's, I think over 10,000 businesses, is a very significant achievement. And bear in mind, LBS is a real collection agency. They've had to reprofile themselves and, 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 and get additional powers to turn themselves into a grant making body. So it was never in their makeup or in their nature. I, and I think they have done a remarkable job, and albeit I accept. Those people who are out there are still waiting to get payment. Uh, we'll still be anxious about that. We will obviously try and address those as quickly as possible. But I do think uh, I, I welcome your acknowledgement of the work that has been done by staff. In relation to the statement, as I said to the chair, my intention is if we get agreement tomorrow to do a written statement so that people can be informed uh, right away and to, to ask 
uh, permission of the Speaker on Monday to make an oral statement uh, to the Assembly, so people will have an hour, I think, on the back of that to ask questions. That's fine. Okay, thanks, um, just then, on the rates issue, um, obviously the decision to defer uh, uh, and give an amnesty to businesses for rates this year has been a huge, made a huge difference to struggling companies. Is your budget for 2021-22 predicated on a return to normal rating activity? And is there any leeway to, to, to change that? Because uh, the way things are going, I don't think many businesses will be back to anything like normal at the start of the next financial year. Where do we stand as far as that crucial element is concerned? Well, I think it's a fair point, uh, and it's one that we've been discussing with businesses for uh, quite some time. And obviously, uh, all businesses, as you know, at the start of financial year, got a four-month rate holiday, which was very welcome. But then we had a more targeted rate relief uh, for others, uh, which we recently added back into it, manufacturing at the request of the uh, Minister of the Economy. Uh, and so I, I've had many discussions with business and business organisations, and that was very welcome. And as you're quite right, uh, there is a concern among businesses that it will be some time before they're back to as normal a trade arrangements as they possibly can be. So we have earmarked £150 million uh, for a, at least six months continuation of rates relief for those businesses that, that have got it over the course of the year. Uh, we, we are hoping that the COVID carryover money uh, will cover that and obviously we'll, we'll have to have a conversation in relation to the voucher scheme and the additional 500 million COVID uh, that we'll get in the new financial year. Uh, it is our intention to try our best to provide an additional six months rate relief to all those businesses who got the full year in recognition that it could well be uh, into the late summer and the autumn before businesses are back to or operating as normally as they can. I think that's very good news um, because surely at the end of that six months uh, things will have hopefully returned to something half normal so business will very much welcome that. Uh, finally, um, we're in an area, area of historic low interest rates. Governments and local uh, assemblies can borrow money at incredibly low uh, interest rates for quite a considerable period. And you've alluded to the fact that you've got a facility for 200 million. Surely, given the fact that you can get the money so cheaply, would it not be worth considering either using further facilities or asking the Treasury to enable us to borrow money at the moment uh, uh, for, for next to nothing, basically, to enable, for instance, some infrastructure processes to go ahead? Yeah. Um, Why aren't we using the 200 million? You're here. You know, rather than. You know, uh, trying to uh, increase, get it out of uh, departmental day-to-day uh, -day running budgets. Yeah, well, that's why I, I drew attention of the committee to the RRI issue because uh, you're correct. I think there is very low interest rates. Uh, I think to to borrow the full two hundred million pounds, uh, the interest rate for the executive over the course of the year. So I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Is about one point one million. Uh, for, for the 200, uh, but of course these, these things have to be borrowed against projects uh, and the RRI has to be against projects which would have a, uh, uh, it's over a 25 year period, so there are projects which have a lifetime of 25 years, so you are talking about things like uh, infrastructure, uh, be that you know some of the necessary sewage and water infrastructure that, that will not only be, be necessary for all our water to do, but will actually stimulate and, and facilitate private sector investment in in, uh, in construction, uh, but things like housing, things like the school estate, the health estate, uh, assets which would last a long time. Uh, and of course, I think you're correct that we, and that's I put a proposition to the executive in relation to RRI borrowing, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that will be agreed to. And I think if if there are proposals uh, from other departments to, to access the full amount, that, that stack up and that have that, as I say, 25 year uh, lifespan, then I, I think that it's something that we should be considering, particularly in the context of a very flat budget and also in the context that we need to try and stimulate economic recovery. Construction represents about 20% of our economic output mm. uh, and therefore I think anything which we can do to and stimulate that would be very helpful indeed. Uh, uh, well, could, could you just say, I mean, at 1.1 million, that's not 0.55% this is a chance of a lifetime for you as finance minister to access capital at 
you know, unbelievably low interest rates. When, when, when you were last chair of the Finance Committee, you would only have dreamt of the Minister being able to, to, to buy money at that incredibly low rate. So can we have a commitment that you're going to at least hit the £200 million this year, in, in coming year? Well, I, 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 can, I can certainly tell you that I put a proposition to the executive. Hitting the two hundred million means that uh, various departments have to come in with schemes or proposals that can use up the money. So I can't go into the departments and, and they can, like extract schemes and say hey, we're going to do this. So it has to be propositions. I flag this up as a very serious uh, issue of strategic interest to the executive. Uh, I've asked people to go off and think about it, and I, th I hope between now and the final budget paper that we get, it's, it's, it's my hope, and that's of course a matter for the executive, but that we do get as much access and, and usage uh, of, of that as we possibly can as an executive. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Eddie. Gemma. Thank you. Thanks, Connor, and thanks, Joanne. Um, and I want to echo Jim Wells' words actually around the staff. Um, I know I do still have some outstanding queries, but I'm sure they'll be worked out. Um, See, just on the budget process, and um, excuse my ignorance, but I'm trying to make sense of the delay, or how the delay was allowed to happen with the paper. Um, I thought there was a three-meeting rule um, around bringing papers to the executive, and so I just want to want your thoughts on that. Well, the, uh, uh, there is a uh, written down in protocol a three-meeting rule. We actually had this experience last year uh, when I was trying to get a paper. Uh, I think it was on financial support for the airports, uh, and we had to try and get it on the agenda for a number of meetings. And at that stage, I tried to invoke the three meeting rule, and I had this uh, conversation with the then head of the civil service who informed us that the three meeting rule was a protocol, uh, but it didn't have a legal binding, and therefore it effectively wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Uh, so uh, we, I, I think it's something, I think it's a matter that the executive need to address in terms of looking at how executive business is conducted, uh, because there are important papers, and uh, if executive ministers consider them and reject them, then that's the prerogative of the executive, but if you can't get a discussion on them, then it's a very frustrating place to be in. Yeah, I can imagine how frustrating that would be. Did you say that it happened at the airports as well? So this has happened before? It, it, it has happened on occasions uh, that papers, I'm not sure the experience of other parts, but it certainly has happened to me on a, on a number of occasions uh, that we haven't been able to get uh, a paper tabled in the executive, certainly taken more than three meetings, I would imagine. Bear in mind the executive is now meeting, uh, at some stages was meeting on three times a week, uh, it's now meeting twice a week. Uh, Previous, I suppose, iterations, perhaps when this protocol was drawn up, the executive might have met once a week, or in some cases, if I remember back to my previous executive experience, it was once a fortnight. Uh, so there is a greater frequency of meetings. Uh, but nonetheless, I think I think we should have an arrangement where, by uh, uh, at the very least, uh, uh, a paper is tabled for discussion uh, and allowed to take the collective executive view of it uh, as to whether it should progress or not. So just just for clarity, Connor, so that was. Eight times you had to table the budget before it actually got onto the agenda. I, I think, to be honest, I think it's five or possibly it, it's been on the. I think it might be five, possibly six, if it's on the agenda for discussion. Uh, I suppose by the time it's eventually taken, if, if it is decided on tomorrow, it might be six or seven times. Okay, that's grand. Yeah, I think we might consider a letter about that. I, I think, think so. The, yeah, uh, ex, the first and deputy first ministers about that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, Matthew? Thank, um, thank you. Uh, Happy New Year, Minister. Um, uh, did, were you given a reason why it was blocked? You, as in, did the First and Deputy First Minister or TO explain why it didn't get on the agenda? Well, I, the, the, the problem was at the First Minister's side. Uh, there were a number of reasons in, uh, uh, offered over the course of the the, since December through to yesterday, uh, one of them was replacement of European funding for the Department of the Economy, uh, which I couldn't guarantee uh, because it would have meant taking it from another department. But what I could do, uh, as well as what I have been doing, is is uh, engaging very hard with Treasury in terms of, of the British government fulfilling its commitment to replace all lost EU funding in full. Uh, and of course, the executive, as, as Scotland has a similar position and Wales has a similar position, the executive should have control over the, the, uh, 
the usage of that money, uh, and that's, that's a matter which continues to raise concern for us as, as with the, uh, the bill that has been gone through uh, Westminster uh, in, in relation to that. Uh, other issues advanced were RRI borrowing and uh, some of that, that varied in terms of what it might be used for and uh, we're back and forth a number of times uh, but we weren't able uh, it seemed to reach a resolution and then yesterday morning there was an agreement uh, to uh, have a further discussion with the first uh, and deputy first yesterday morning and then there was an agreement to table the paper for discussion I did this executive which obviously I welcome because I, I, I want to give executive colleagues an opportunity to have their input into us. Uh, we have had uh, through correspondence and through engagement with the department, but collectively we have an input into it. And so, as I say, I'm hopeful that tomorrow then we'll be able to take, take a decision on it. Okay. Specifically on on the um, on the RRI borrowing point, uh, and I and it doesn't happen very often, but I f could could not agree more with Jim Wells about um, access. And as I've said to you before in the chamber, minister, I think we should be accessing that given that debt is very low and we don't know what sovereign debt could get very much more expensive in the years to come depending on the global economy and markets you know so we should strike while the cost is low but specifically in relation to the query that was raised about rri it sounds like there were um uh the first minister had an issue with was it a specific project that was suggested or a or specific departmental department accessing RRI. What was her concern? Well, I, I can only give you an impression because obviously the, 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 the conversations are between ministers. Uh, I mean, are a matter, of, I suppose, of trying to ensure confidence in executive business uh, to, to try. But uh, there was a general issue really to RRI, and then I think there was a specific issue in terms of an allocation to a department and what it might be used for. Uh, it's obviously up to the department to stack up uh, what they're using and, uh, and whether they can, in fact, make full use of it. But bear in mind, uh, if a department isn't going to uh, make use of our department, as, uh, as they've indicated, then we can revisit the issue. Uh, over the course of the year, I'm sure Joanne can keep us right because I think the RRI issue uh, it's effectively a monthly borrowing exercise. Is it Joanne? Maybe you could give some explanations how it operates. Yeah, you're right, Minister. It's it's um, we factor their borrowing plans into the budget, but we don't actually access the borrowing at that time. We do it monthly in advance of incurring any expenditure, and we get monthly profiles from departments of what the requirement is. So if we were to build it into the budget plans now, but things were to change, then we wouldn't actually access that borrowing, or we could substitute one project for another. But that way, we make sure that we don't borrow what we don't need to borrow, and we minimise the costs. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. So uh, that's that's why I think I was uh, I I uh, put it to the executive as a serious proposition to consider not only by the cost, though, but I think we can access it as we need it, and we don't have to overextend ourselves in relation to it. Okay, okay. but. You, you'd be fairly um, confident that when you give a statement to the assembly beginning of next week, there will be. If, if, so, if there isn't uh, a proposal on RRI being in budget for twenty one twenty two, it's because it hasn't been agreed to the executive. It's because minister, others have pushed back on it. Uh, well, I, I think from the conversation yesterday, uh, I, I'd be surprised if there isn't a proposition in relation to it. I think uh, I, I, the, the question was more on the minister's interest in access and some of the propositions that I put. Because uh, I, I think, as you say, there's up to 200 million, and that depends on how many departments want to avail of it and bring in projects which can access it. Uh, so I, I would think I, I'd be surprised if, if we get the budget paper agreed that there isn't. A level of RRI borrowing is, uh, I would hope that if other departments have an interest, then that could even uh, increase between now and the final budget paper. Okay. If I could ask briefly, Chair, about um, uh, where are we on under? Do you know what the total, do you have a global number for underspend for this financial year? As in, well, what, there's, what, yeah, sorry. Sorry, there's two elements to that. One is, the normal underspend, if you like, that will appear in the January monitoring round, and I think it's our intention next week, uh, John can keep me right, to bring a January monitoring round paper to the executive. Uh, the, there's also COVID money, and as 
I mean, January monitoring will deal with, I suppose, the smaller end of things and this kind of thing, the natural spend of departments and what hasn't been used and what comes back into the centre at the tail end of the year for reallocation. Uh, and we, we're working through, we had a discussion this morning with Joanne and her team in relation to that, we're working through that paper to get it to the executive next week. Uh, but there is a bigger issue in terms of COVID uh, and underspend, potential underspend there, because as you, as you know, we had when the, the last 200 million came in, uh, we have 3 billion of that to spend, and there, there may well be further allocation. And that's why we have been exercised not only in terms of spending that out, finding out from departments if money they've already bid for isn't going to be used, and, and we've some sense back today from the economy and reach that voucher scheme. So, those are significant uh, uh, portions of money to try and allocate and spend out within now and the end of the financial year. So, I've been encouraging for some time now and, and written to departments, raised the matter of the executive that departments need to identify very early if they're not going to spend out money they've already received and if there are other areas that they could in fact try and get support out uh, using the COVID allocations we've had uh, onto the ground very very quickly uh, I think it will be a real challenge and that's why we've also been exercised in trying to get the uh, the carryover into the new year so we have as much potential to carry over as we possibly can but there is an urgency on spending this out there are many sectors uh, that feel they haven't got support at all or enough support and I think if we get to the end of the financial year, particularly in relation to COVID money, and we have significant amounts that we haven't been able to spend and we can't carry over, then I think there will be probably uh, due criticism uh, of departments for not getting that money out as quickly as we can to people that need it. And, and if, if I may, when you say departments, are there specific departments that you're referring to or concerned about? Well, I'm asking all departments. Uh, I mean, w w firstly, I, I think most departments, if not all, have got COVID money, uh, and uh, and people bid for it over the course of the year, and then projects attached to it, and things they needed to do, uh, supports they needed to get out, and and we, we've met all of those. So we want early feedback. Some of those schemes and things that people put out were based on uptake uh, and where that hasn't perhaps materialised in the level they anticipated then. We need early sight of that and we have got some, I think from one or two departments who've had some early sight back of monies they have not or don't uh, believe they will be able to spend. Uh, so the question is to try and get that reallocated to schemes which can deliver between now and the end of the financial year. And that is, uh, there's, there's no doubt, uh, there's no way to avoid that. That is going to be a significant challenge. And that's why, as I say, we're equally focusing on carryover as well. Uh, but there is a challenge for people to get uh, money spent out. And we have been encouraging all departments uh, to try and step up in spending the money we've been allocated, but also looking at new ways uh, and other ways and, and areas that perhaps haven't received support uh, over the course of the year in response to the pandemic to try and find ways to get support to them. Okay, thanks. Paul? Yes, thank you, and Minister. I'll echo your comments around LPS, and I know other members here has, has uh, stated so also. Uh, with regards to what you say about them being a, a money collecting agency, having to be changed to a grant support agency. So, and again, uh, all members of the staff and Ian Snowden, uh, Chief Executive, who, when he's at this committee, he, equi he equips himself very well. So, uh, I, I echo those comments that you've made. I also well, I wish you, Minister, and Joanne there a happy new year. Uh, officially, I know I did that earlier on the week when we met, but uh, just officially ha wish you a happy new year. Can, can I ask, Minister, did, did I hear you right when you said that you might not be able to achieve an eight-week consultation for the budget? Yes, uh, I think now we're down to a time frame uh, where that is, is probably unlikely. Yeah. Uh, Joanne could give me maybe the, the, the date, uh, the actual date, because I know we were down to seven weeks, and I think that that might even reduce further now, uh, given uh, uh, the delay even this week. Oh, six, yes, Minister, um, in order to allow time for us to consider fully the responses that come back to the consultation and then develop a uh, a final budget paper for the executive. I think we're we're talking about the consultation closing around the twenty third to the twenty fifth of, of February. Okay. Um, because bearing in mind that we have to have a final budget read before the thirty first of March, so you know that puts a lot of pressure on getting the paper through the executive and getting a final budget to the the assembly before the thirty first of March. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister. You talk about your your six attempts to get your budget uh, your your paper. Uh, to the agenda of the executive. Can I ask, out of all of those 
versions. I, I take it that all of those six attempts, there was changes and tweaks within the budget paper itself. What version of the paper was RRI first established within the paper? Well, I, I, I can, that specific point, I can put to Joanne, but can I say that when, when you initially put a paper out to executive colleagues, uh, a number of them will come back uh, uh, with written responses. Uh, and if for, for some reason that paper, or, or maybe you decide to hold back the paper because uh, you want to address some of those issues, or you reissue a paper trying to address some of the issues uh, that have been raised in between uh, ministers receiving it and the, the executive might have been scheduled for. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a fairly common and regular occurrence that papers will be tweaked to reflect some of the responses and feedback from uh, various ministers. The RRI issue came as actually a consequence of feedback from departments to say, are there other ways we could access capital money because the budget isn't good for the year going ahead and we would like to access more capital money. That's why RRI was introduced. So I'm not sure which version, uh, we're up to about version five, possibly six now of the paper. Uh, which version would that have been, uh, Joanne, maybe three or so in around that? Um, I don't have the, the various versions in front of me, Minister. Yes, we're, we're in version five at the minute, and I think you're right, it, it was around version three. Um, the changes between the versions sometimes have been quite minimal, but as you say, they're reacting to the responses we're getting from departments. Okay, thank you. And, and can, can you say, Minister, then, that, because I, I, I know that the, the answers to some of the questions here around the delay, and of course, there was a press statement issued about the delay. Can you tell me that there was none of those versions that was agreed by the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister? No, if they were agreed by the First or Deputy First Minister, it, 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 the, the way they agreed with them, uh, and it doesn't even necessarily mean they agree the entire content, the First and Deputy First Minister have agreed to allow it onto the agenda. I have submitted it to every executive meeting that we've had since the 10th of December, uh, and it has not made it onto the agenda. Uh, that means that there has not been an agreement. I, I understand from talking to the, the Deputy First Minister that she has been content to allow it on the agenda from the first meeting. Uh, I submitted it forward and it has only made the agenda yesterday. Uh, so it is it's an up to the First Deputy First Minister to agree uh, the agenda for the executive meetings, including what papers are included. Uh, if one of them did not agree for a paper to walk, then unfortunately it can't go on. With regards to the... You, you, you did say that you had distributed a paper to all ministers in order to give them good time and space to to uh, assess the, the, the proposals within your paper. Uh, was, there, was there no time whenever there was a discussion around maximising the RRI spending envelope, considering that both health and education should well have rolling capital programmes? So, so surely it's a case of, and I get your point with regards, you need the departments to bid for the RRI, but surely it should be a case of any minister lifting off that rolling capital programme that I'm sure is years advanced and just adopting that programme for RRI spending. Well, as you say, it is up to the Minister to come forward and say that's what they wish to do. Uh, the RRI uh, matter was in response to uh, a number of departments coming back and saying we would like access to capital. Bear in mind, uh, in terms of uh, the time frame for all of this, this was already constrained because the comprehensive spend review didn't end until the 25th of November, and therefore the additional two-week period for the Secretary of State to confirm the budget envelope, if you like, uh, they took us into December. So we were already in a constrained time frame uh, in terms of getting this out to consultation. Uh, and of course, the paper can change over the process of consultation. And I, I would expect that some of the ministers will come back, uh, perhaps over this uh, period that Johanna's outlined, to say we would like to access RRI borrowing for be it school buildings or health buildings or whatever other schemes they might be interested in. And of course, the department are very happy to work with them to, uh, to identify those. So. Uh, it, it, it is a matter for ministers to come forward, as some did, to say we would like to access uh, that, and, and that's how the, the issue became part of the discussion. Uh, you, you talk about a standalone budget, uh, and, and that's, that means pain, basically, uh, for most departments, some more than others. But in this day and age, with the emergency that we're in with regards to our health uh, condition and the condition of our health service, 
I would be amazed uh, if, if the Minister of Health wasn't really troubled and worried with a standalone budget. Oh, yes. And, and also, I'm on the Justice Committee, so I know the pressure on the policing, considering we have the regulations to enforce. Um, and of course, then we also have a pension, the victims' pension issue, to still be resolved. So I would be amazed if the Justice Minister wasn't up in arms about a stand uh, still budget. Uh, surely, surely those two departments on their own uh, would be nervous and really extremely worried about a stand still budget. Uh, I can assure you, all departments are agitated and concerned about uh, a stand still budget, uh, and all of them have expressed that. My own department has to go and look for savings on areas that we were intend to spend out in, uh, and we've already begun that exercise to look. Uh, for things that we may not now do next year that we intend to do as savings that we can make. And every single department is disappointed, is agitated, is concerned uh, about the level of funding available to us next year. But with the time scale involved, uh, if you were to try and match some of the real pressures that all departments are facing, facing then, what you would have to do is, is, is match some pressures and add to pressures in other departments by reprioritization. Uh, and the time frame uh, involved doesn't allow, uh, I don't believe, uh, an exercise. I didn't detect any serious appetite for that type of exercise. But of course, particularly health, the biggest spending department we have, uh, feels these pressures more than anyone. Uh, but all departments are exercised and agitated at the idea of a standstill budget. It's not what any of us wanted. Uh, the final question, uh, Minister. You, you talk about, from um, uh, a question about uh, the underspend for this, this financial year and the possibility of having an underspend, why are we dividing ordinary spend and COVID spend? Surely, surely that COVID money is not ring-fenced. So surely that is, no matter whether it's ordinary spend or COVID spend, if that's an underspend, it will be a, a massive uh, failure on the part of this executive to support businesses that the executive have removed the right for those businesses to earn money and make a profit. Surely that's a failure. No, I, I, I mean, in terms of the ordinary spend, uh, it's just for, I suppose, uh, Joanne can probably explain this, it's, it's for, uh, I wouldn't say for neatness, but for accountancy purposes to keep that spend. And, and we will have enough, uh, my view is we will have enough in January monitoring that has been returned out of the ordinary spend of departments to meet bids that departments have put into us for additional spend in terms of the normal run of the mill. The money that came across to us uh, in relation to COVID was intended to be used for COVID issues now, uh, I, I, and, and that's what we have by and large used it for. Uh, there's no doubt that it's supplemented uh, departments' budgets, uh, but it is intended to be used for that. Uh, and so uh, it's not a question of, of uh, there, in my view, there is sufficient money in there uh, to address a lot of the issues that people have raised concerns with us. Uh, I, I've been encouraging departments, as I say, firstly, to identify a previous schemes they've got if they're not utilising them in full, to get that money back into the centre uh, and to come up with some additional ways to look at some of the sectors and, and sections and areas that perhaps haven't received either any support or sufficient support to try and address ourselves to them. So there is a concern uh, with three billion pounds uh, on top of the budgets we already had for spending out. There's a significant amount of money to spend for across departments uh, in a challenging situation where quite a lot of staff are working from home, people are down in or isolating because of COVID. It's a challenge, and uh, we would need to try and ensure that that is spent out uh, as, as best we possibly can by the end of the last year. And as I said, that's also the reason that we have pressed for flexibility to allow us to carry over some of that, which, which could meet some of the challenges that we undoubtedly will be presented with next year. In, in my time, Minister, I've never heard a minister or a department say that they've had enough money in their budget. Uh, and here we have extra money not being able to be spent. In my eyes, that well, is a failure. Yeah, I mean, I'm about slightly longer than yourself, and I've never had that experience either, where people are saying, uh, oh, this has been an extraordinary year, uh, and I'm not saying the money will not be spent. What I'm saying is we are concerned and exercised about getting it spent, and we're pressing departments to do that. Uh, so uh, there is, is, is a, has been a significant amount of COVID money given to us. It is a challenge to spend it on. Some of it has come very late in the year, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm of the same uh, view as I have 
all departments have always been seeking more money. But the question is, is what they can spend it on with between now and the end of the financial year. So it's one thing departments have a lot of uh, budgetary issues they'd like to address, but if they can't spend it out between now and the end of the financial year, then they will end up giving it back again. So it has to be it has to be bid for in something that can be utilised, and that's why we've asked people to get their thinking caps on and uh, to to uh, really find ways to spend out this money. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Okay, thanks for three. Jim, Jim Minister. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, though it's interesting to observe and to hear the executive's washing of its dirty linen in, in public over whose fault the delay is, I think it's inescapable uh, to conclude that this saga of delay uh, and indeed the telescoping in consequence of um, scrutiny uh, and a consultation is itself a very poor commentary on the efficiency of this executive and of devolution. But there are a couple of questions I want to ask the Minister, if I might. First of all, on RRI, my recollection of RRI when it was introduced was that there was linkage made to the uh, floating of water charges. Has that now been withdrawn by the Treasury, and is there no longer any proviso attaching to RRI in that regard? No. Go ahead, go ahead John. Sorry, I was going to say if I can come in there because sorry, I, unfortunately, I've been around long enough that I, that I remember that well. When it was initially introduced, um, it was linked to called what they called qualifying revenue which is increases in sort of household charges here compared to council tax in England. So you're right, there was a sort of link to water charges. That was broken in the St Andrews Agreement, and there's no longer that direct linkage. OK, thank you. So on the uh, RRI, the Minister indicated that uh, there was talk of £70 million for infrastructure, for water and sewage, £70 million for housing. Uh, is that the totality of the... Um, bid or ambition for RRI? Well, I, I had, as, as, as you know, uh, Jim, it, it depends on what departments come in to request for uh, in terms of access to RRI. Uh, I, I mean, in relation to your initial point, I don't get any satisfaction uh, from uh, difficulties in terms of getting executive papers on, but the committee is entitled and have asked me questions as to where this is at and why it hasn't been uh, put on the agenda and I, I'm obliged to give the answers. Uh, I say I don't get any satisfaction from it. I wish that we had got the paper on on the 10th of December and been well through our consultation process at now. But uh, I think from the discussion yesterday at the Executive Innovation RRI, there will be other departments will go off now and look, and I've invited them to come and talk to Department of Finance officials in relation to how that might uh, satisfy them. Because I think uh, it is a marginal increase in terms of uh, the interest, uh, if we were to access the full 200 million, uh, and as others have indicated, and I've been asked many questions, possibly by yourself as well, over the course of the year, about not accessing uh, resources that might be available to us, then I think that uh, if departments can come up with schemes that match, then I'm more than happy uh, to look at that for them. Uh, would the hydrogen hub scheme be such a candidate? I, I don't honestly know. Uh, it, 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 it may well depend on the, the length of time it would, the asset would be then be you would be available to be set against the borrow, if you like. Uh, but I'm certainly open to consideration in relation to uh, any of those uh, projects. It would be a matter for the Department of the Economy to come forward and, and say we have a project here which we would be interested in accessing our RI over. Uh, perhaps Joanne could remind us. Uh, of course, on RRI, you just don't pay back the interest, you pay back the capital. Uh, mm -hmm. And is that tied into a, an, a, a schedule of payments over a number of years? Or how, how exactly does that work? Yes, that's correct. You pay back the principal as, as well as paying interest on it. And it's a schedule of payments, um, twice yearly, acting cash terms, twice yearly payments over the lifetime of the loan. And the loan is linked to the lifetime of the asset, which is why the minister is referring to assets uh, which have a 25 year lifespan because obviously that is more beneficial than you wouldn't want to borrow for something which only had a short life the lifetime but, but you could could you 
you you could but you wouldn't want to and you definitely i mean while you could there would be a restriction on that you wouldn't borrow for something that only had say a one or two year lifespan you're probably talking be 15 to 25 years and if five ten years into the scheme interest rates suddenly aren't as they are at the moment what's the consequence well, the interest rate is set when we actually access the borrowing. So, um, as I was saying earlier, we borrow monthly in so advance, it's fixed term, and, it's fixed. and it's set on the day we borrow for the fixed term. Five years years or whatever. Yes. Very good. So, um, just a couple of other questions for the uh, minister. Within the budget that's now been tentatively put forward, uh, how much has been set aside for the innocent victims' pension? Well, uh, firstly, I, I can't get into detail of that. There is, as you will know, an ongoing discussion with the NIO and with the Treasury in relation to responsibility for meeting that cost, and that hasn't been concluded. I understand that there has been a proposition put to the Secretary of State to meet with the first Deputy First uh, Minister for Justice and myself, uh, and that meeting hasn't yet been secured. So we do want to bottom out uh, that, that cost because depending on the uptake, on such a scheme, then the cost could be so prohibitive to the executive as to really damage a huge range of public services uh, if that were to be met. So there is an issue uh, in terms of this uh, fund statement. The, the the body which proposes the legislation derives and drafts the policy and implements that then is responsible for the payment of that. And that, of course, in this case, is the British government uh, and the NIO. Uh, and so we have yet to be able to bottom that out. Uh, there has been some money set aside to get the scheme up to work, but it is coming to the point where payments will be due to be made, and that that uh, discussion needs to conclude sooner rather than later. And are you saying to us that if that discussion does not conclude on a satisfactory basis, that there will be no money in your budget? for the payment of the actual pension? Well, uh, what I'm saying is that if, uh, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, the the amount set aside for that for year one would be, I haven't got the figure on the top of my head now, but what I'm saying is if we end up shouldering the responsibility for paying that out, that my advice to the executive would be that we would have to do a very serious reprioritization exercise which will impact very significantly on public services uh, to meet that uh, to meet that commitment but are you or are you not anticipating a budget line to deal with the cost of paying the pension no no I, I put down a draft budget and what we want to do is conclude the discussions with the secretary of state ahead of the final budget so we know what the position is and, and I'm probing the point if you don't get the conclusion you're looking for, with the Secretary of State, is there not going to be any money provided in the Northern Ireland executive budget to pay for the pension? Well, that would be a matter for the executive to decide. Uh, my my advice to the executive would be if they decide to pick up the tab for that, and that's that's a, of course uh, a question for the executive to decide themselves. If they decide to pick up the tab, then that will have very serious implications on spending across all departments and on public service provided for in this budget. If the executive choose to, to do that, then that, that, the implications of that would be profound, I think, uh, because not only will they be picking up for next year's budget, but they will have in principle accepted the cost of paying for that scheme, uh, which will have long-lasting implications for future budgets as well. And if they don't make provision, then there's no pension. Uh, that's not the case. It would be, no, the, 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 the question is as to who makes provision for it. Uh, and the question is whether it, that is the responsibility of the executive. Under the British government's own statement of funding policy, it's their responsibility to pay for it. And I think we need, to, and we haven't, it's unsatisfactory that we haven't been able to conclude those discussions, but the Secretary of State has not been that available uh, in recent times when we've sought meetings with them. So I'm hoping that that can be concluded and that the government will recognise their own rules in relation to this and recognise that the burden that that would place on the executive. Uh, given that it's not what we as uh, parties agree to at uh, the Stormont House Agreement, then I, I think I hope that they will recognise that, that they have a contribution to make their. Uh, if they don't, and if the executive decides to not really pick up the top uh, for next year, which the budget is set for, uh, but I think by doing that, in principle, pick up the tab forevermore, then that has profound implications. Well, it has profound implications for innocent victims if the pension is snatched away again, having been promised. 
Yes, absolutely, and that is not a situation that anybody wants to be in. And I, I don't think it has been. I don't think it has been. Uh, it's been helpful to victims that we have ended up in this dispute. But the government took a different approach to that, uh, which was agreed by the political parties at Stormont House, headed off in a new direction with this, legislated for it, and then said, "So, oh, by the way, you have to pick up the tab." And I don't think that's a fair situation. Is Chief Finn continuing to just play games with that at the expense of innocent victims? No, it's not at all. I mean, the executive can. The executive, well, Jim, you will know, the executive can take a decision. It's not the Department of Finance's policy area. It's actually the policy area of TEO. And the executive can take a decision on race. I think all of us recognise, firstly, that it's not the scheme that we agreed to. And secondly, that the British government uh, have a responsibility, given that many of the the victims' issues were created under their watch, uh, not the executive's watch, but that they have a responsibility themselves uh, to that. So I I hope we get a solution to it sooner rather than later, because I don't think it is helpful. Uh, to victims that they have to hang on with us. Sounds to, be, sounds to be, Minister, you're trying to extract. Uh, the thank, thank you, thank you, thank want. you very much, Jim. I think the Jim, victim Jim, was, Jim. the pension would also apply to victim in acres. Jim, That's the price of the pension. That's quite disgraceful. Jim, here. Yeah, well, Jim, I think it's disgraceful to formulate a policy and then refuse uh, to provide financial support to back up the policy that you have formulated. I think that's that, that's disgraceful to victims because I think it is a quite a cynical game at the end. I won't be playing in relation to this. Oh, I think when we talk about cynical games, we need to look no for no further than the Sinn Féin's right. I, I think. I, thank, 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 thank you very much indeed, Jim. Thank you very much indeed, Minister, and thank you very much indeed. Your points are made, but thank you. That has been noted, Pat. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And uh, I know that some of the other committee members there have wished to have a new year to you and Joanne, and no doubt your house is a busier house with your new grandchild just delivered there just before Christmas. So well done to that. Minister, I'm just looking down, and I, was, uh, I wanted to ask you about the £45 million required to address the shortfall in the Department of the Economy, and uh, trying to work that through. That money is not in. That, as, as stated, that money is not there. And how, how, will, how are you going to allow for that if, if there is no extra funding that comes in for that money? Well, the, uh, the, the government again committed to uh, replacing in full any lost EU funding. So that £45 million, I think, would be for next year the EU funding that the, had we stayed in the European Union. Uh, and acceded to the democratic wishes of the people of this place, then that funding would have been in the Department of the Economy's coffers next year. Uh, the government guaranteed then as part of their Brexit arguments that they would replace in full. And as, as you know, we've had this discussion many times at the Assembly uh, that they, they, they certainly be the expectation of all of the devolved institutions is that we would have that money in full plus the responsibility for advising programmes and allocating against the priorities programmes uh, the EU money. So we haven't got that certainty as yet from Treasury uh, at this moment. If we can get it between now and the final budget paper, then that is that's uh, helpful. If we can't, then that money is not in the Department of the Economy's budget for next year. So that means the programmes that they ran, which would have operated on the European Social Fund or Erasmus or various programme funds that they were able to draw down, they are not available until next year. Uh, and that is a big problem for the department, but it's a big problem for society here and all of those who were able to avail of the uh, spending in those programmes. Uh, so it's a challenge, but it's a, a it's an area uh, alongside a couple of other areas that we continue to engage Treasury on, and I hope for answers and solutions those things sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, and I hope I, I hope that some of those promises made pre-Brexit uh, probably will uh, will come true. But like most of the other promises, Minister, I hope you agree with me. I wouldn't be holding my breath on them. Um, Minister, the time scale. What are the time scales associated with this budget bill in terms of the committee's role? It seems to be condensing, and you know, it's not doesn't seem to be able to give us the time in order to do the, the the consultation on it, which is required. Well, I, I think Pat, that was already constrained by matters beyond yeah. our control, and that the comprehensive spend review originally was to take place in the summertime, was pushed back into the autumn, didn't conclude really until the end of November, and we didn't get the, the funding amount um, confirmed until December. Uh, so that already constrained, but I think the difficulty in getting this paper through the executive has shortened that even further, and I, I, that's 
uh, something that I regret and I'm very disappointed in. Uh, so it does place the committee and all of the other committees uh, in, a, in a difficult position in terms of trying to turn around uh, uh, consultation and examination of this and uh, discussions with their own departments in relation to that. Uh, and that's not something that I wanted to see, but that's that's the position we're in. So it is not. Uh, it's it's not even it's not ideal. It's it's uh, it is very disappointing. Uh, it was a short time frame anyway, uh, and it's been shortened further, and that's not what I wanted to see. Okay, um, I, I just want to bring up the point. To, I mean, it's um, it's just on the RRI powering. We know this brought up by this committee months ago, and I was wondering why was it not acted on probably months ago because it looks it only has made its way in quite recently. Well, it, 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 it takes departments to come to us and say, uh, you know, I suppose people were waiting to see what the allocations were for next year, and they only really got those in December, and we quickly turned around the draft budget paper, really within days of getting that confirmation of the figure. So it, it was, it's not that departments had a long run in, in a sense of what was coming to them. Uh, so so it, was, it really takes departments to come and bid to us and say, we'd like to access RRI, we have capital projects we think could could avail of it, and, and then we included that in a later version of the budget paper. And as I say, hopefully, uh, if other departments are interested, we live in even a, a larger figure attached to the final budget paper. Okay. And Minister, do you think that there'll be further evidence from the departments for easements on the budget as they come through on the, the January monitoring round? Do you believe that that some of that money is which? which we have asked, you have no idea how or where or what departments, you have no evidence yet for what will be coming back. No, we, we have. I, I think we, Joanne could give you the dates where we concluded both uh, in January monitoring and in COVID, uh, unspent COVID. Uh, I think the, the, Joanne will know the dates that we asked for. We've already asked, so we have feedback from departments already in relation to that's why we, this morning, were talking through the detail of a January monitor paper, which, uh, and a COVID spend paper, both of which I hope to go to the executive next week, and then that detail will be made available, obviously, to the committees and the uh, and the uh, assembly generally. Well, I think if the chair will allow me, I uh, don't know if it would be appropriate just to ask, but uh, the money, the 10.9 million, which is to, to be brought back to the department from supermarkets and large stores, there's no guarantee that that will come back. Well, that, that, that arrangement was with Treasury, uh, because most of those big supermarkets are headquartered in Britain. Uh, and the, uh, our understanding, Joanne can give me right this, uh, the arrangement was that they would pay Treasury back the rates uh, that they had given, got relief on that they are now saying that they, they didn't need and they, they voluntarily given that back. And that Treasury would work out our proportion of that and that that they would be allocated to us. Whether it comes in year, this year, or into the next financial year, Joanne might have a clearer idea in relation to that. Right. Yes, Minister, um, you're correct. It was, it was originally um, organised through Treasury. My understanding is at the minute is that the supermarkets and, and any other business that wants to voluntarily return the, their rates payments can do so either via the Treasury or direct to ourselves. But you're absolutely right. We've no guarantee in that. It's a voluntary payment. They don't actually have a rates bill to pay. So it's a voluntary contribution. And we have no control over the timing of that. Mm. It, it will be up to those organisations when they choose to refund that money to us. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pat. Sir, Minister, thank you very much indeed for your time. Just two very short ones just before we sort of conclude. Um, fresh Start Capital. Has the Treasury agreed to reprofile uh, the four hundred million or so uh, for uh, unspent Fresh Start Capital? There has been discussion with them, I think, particularly in relation to Strood Campus. Yeah. Uh, Joanne could perhaps give you uh, an update on that, but I know there's ongoing discussion with them on that. Yes, Minister, you're correct that they have agreed to approve a revised profile for the Strule campus and that that money can be accessed for that. Um, I'm not sure whether that agreement extends to the, the full level. I have a feeling that it doesn't. We're still in discussions with them okay. on um, that. And, and that's one of the things we would need to be factored into the Secretary of State's confirmation of our, of our funding totals before we can include in the budget. Okay, Joanne, just to let us know once you get some response on that, that would be uh, very much appreciated. And the final bit is, uh, obviously, we can't go without asking, how are we getting on with progress for both the Procurement Board, which I understand that's already sat, and the Fiscal Council, which uh, we still haven't seen? Okay, well, the Procurement Board reconstituted, uh, it did meet prior to Christmas. It's due for its uh, second meeting uh, 
in I think the early days of February. Uh, we have a number of papers going to it in, in terms of uh, I think the terms of reference for it uh, are, are going to the executive for approval as well. So we've had some discussion with the board in relation to that. As you know, we want to we want to give the executive ownership of procurement matters in, in that that will enforce procurement policy right down to the various departments and public uh, bodies, arm length bodies as well. Uh, so it's it's going very well. Uh, if, uh, the first week was excellent. Uh, good contributions from the people who've been brought in. And I think that we can uh, look forward to uh, good bits of work done by the, the reconstituted procurement board. The fiscal council, we are well advanced in terms of our engagement with people in relation to that. And I hope in the very, very near future to be able to bring uh, a proposition to the executive and then obviously discuss that with the committee. Uh, but we are very well advanced in relation to that. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Minister John, thank you very much indeed for your time. And uh, Best of luck and just keep us informed and uh, let's have a fruitful and good working relationship for the, the rest of this year. Yeah. Okay, team. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Minister on Spotlight. Okay, team, just to wrap up on this, a couple of things. Um, three points have brought out of this one. Uh, first one, I think um, the fact that we've had to put the budget through how many times? Five or six. Close Five or six times. Time. I don't think it's acceptable. And uh, I think as a committee... I will uh, write on the, the committee's behalf to the first and deputy first ministers to say, you know, a budget if is the foundation stone of effective governments in Northern Ireland, and when the budget is should be tabled, should be ready to, to go through uh, to, to do that. To just on that, can I ask then for clarification? I think we need to be asking the question of the uh, first minister, deputy first minister, as to why there wasn't agreement and if they had agreed any of the versions. Let's put that. Let's put that on the alert. If we're content, content. Content. Well, uh, it's, Jared, could I say something? I think it is important to observe oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, one Jared. side of the story. <laughs> sorry, it, was, it was a disembodied voice that just came <laughs> in there. <I> was... <laughs> Go ahead. So I think it's important to say that uh, we've only heard one side of the story, so to speak. Uh, I wouldn't be one inclined to um, act on only hearing one side of the story. I think, I think the question well, I think, is... I think your letter should rather inquire as to explanation yeah. of why. I, I agree with that. I think, that, I think, that, I think we, could all, we would all be content with that. Um, the second point is, I think, and we've raised this issue because obviously the consultation period is going to be considerably foreshortened. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is do a proper and effective scrutiny of the budget. And we will be asked again on the issues of accelerated passage. Now, we have precedent in the past on issues about whether we grant accelerated passage or not. A previous committee has indeed not uh, uh, gone for accelerated passage. However, I think we should get a uh, legal opinion from the, within the uh, Assembly on the issues that might pertain over, around that issue. But I think it's appropriate that we're armed with that information so we're aware of that. Chair. Sure. Yep, sorry, Pat, go ahead. Um, can I ask you, how many times have we been able to sit down and look at, at accelerated passage as it's come through to us in this past year? Everything seems to be rushed. Now, I can see how it could be rushed with COVID, and I can understand all that, but I, th I don't think there's been anything brought forward to us where we have been given the correct amount of time which is supposed to be all allocated to it. I agree. And if we're content to ask for that advice? Chair, yeah, Chair. just on that issue, uh, of course, the, the executive has been, uh, if you like, uh, snookered somewhat with regards to the lateness of the comprehensive spending review. Uh, but having said that, I think that, well, eight, the eight-week consultation surely is in law. So I would worry about the fact that we don't get ample opportunity to scrutinise as a committee the population do not get ample opportunity to scrutinise as a population. There, there is real dangers and pitfalls here, uh, so I don't think anybody should take this for granted, uh, and that I think we need to be very careful how we chart our course from here on in. Uh, but on, on your, on your, because I agree with Pat, Hello, I, I agree with Pat with regards to, um, you know, accelerated passage should not be seen as mundane or normal. Right. Uh, on the other issue then, just and I'll stop speaking, is uh, if we're writing to the OFM, DFM, uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister, uh, I raised it and Jim Alster raised this about the victims' pensions. Surely there was a court 
determination last year that the mm. executive should uh, yeah. make sure that there was provision for the pension payments. Uh, so I think we should write on that issue also. Uh, you know, we, we could be handing money back here at the end of the year, albeit COVID money, and yet these victims are still denied. The victims' pensions. Um, can you propose a set of words, to Mr Deputy, on the victims' pension for a separate letter for us to write to? Well, well uh, if, I'm right, if I'm right in what I'm saying about the court determination last year, then there was provision, provision to be made in the budget for the money. Provision was to be made by... Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and that onus was placed on the executive, as far as I know. So, you know, I think we should be writing to First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and for all intents and purposes, copy in the Finance Minister, just to see what provision is now going to be catered for for those. And if we, you, you, we have this absurd, absurd uh, period whereby, come here, but we could be handing millions of pounds back to the Exchequer, mm -hmm. but yet those victims will get nothing. It's, it's absurd. Okay. Jim, you're coming in. Sorry, Jim Alistair. Well, I've just yes, I, I, I want to agree with Paul on that, but going back to your point about seeking legal advice, which I'm content with, uh, but if we are seeking legal advice, I think there's another issue we should seek advice on, because if the budget becomes unstuck, and it hasn't had a very fruitful path so far, then the next thing we, we will be told about is going to be a vote on account. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think it's legal to have a vote on account if you haven't got a budget plan. Yep. Yep. So I'd like some advice if that is right or not. Yep. Because a, a vote on account is predicated upon there being a budget plan. Yep. Yep. If there is no budget plan, how do you have a vote on account? Okay. Turn to that. And the final thing, uh, are you content for us to note in the minutes in line with standing orders, the committee agreed without meeting to circulate the minister's correspondence on the 22nd of December. Statutory committee chairpersons. We agree. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, do that as well. Okay. If we move on to the next item, the agenda uh, item number four, uh, which is the written evidence, Department of Finance, January monitoring round. Uh, the following papers are relevant to the agenda. The email from the DLO on page 83 of the meeting packs. Clark's brief on page 12 of the table papers. An update on the Department's January monitoring position at page 16. Remind members this covered the Department's own January monitoring position. The Department advises that it anticipates that it may receive around £11 million from supermarkets. But I think that was raised in discussion with Pat, when Pat was talking to the Minister in respect of repaid rates. And the department suggests a possible pressure of up to £100 million for COVID financial assistance scheme. Do we have any comments? Sorry, is this on the monitoring round, Chair? Yeah, this Sorry. is in the, January, the department's January, January it's monitoring. There's one out there. Can I just say, and I know the clerk has highlighted this in his, his uh, questioning, um, the, uh, they're not filling in the performer correctly, or they're leaving a lot of information out, and that's yes, just me. not acceptable. Since when did we stop doing transparency, and when did we reverse from that position? Uh, well, we were doing it before yeah. uh, before uh, the end of the year, and this seems to be the first one that's come back that looks as if we've just sort of decided yeah. to follow maybe, the example of some other departments. Maybe they just can't be bothered to do transparency. Uh, well, I don't, I don't think I that like is the think case. So. I, would, I would imagine what they probably didn't do is forgot to fill in the form properly, which we'll yeah. invite them to do. Yeah. So I think we have to raise questions on that alone without even getting into the detail. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind members the Department will brief next week after the Minister's statement on the janitory monitoring allocations, etc., for all departments, which we should see, I would imagine, by intent from the Minister. Okay. Uh, if we move on to item number five on the agenda, the draft minutes of the proceeding from the 16th of December, and apologise for the rebrigading of the uh, of the agenda team, but obviously with the, getting the minister in, that's the, uh, where we've been doing it. Oh, has he? Sorry, I'm saying I can't say. Pat, can I? Pat, are you trying to get in contact with us? We ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring them back in. Assembly Broadcasting, can you bring uh, Pat Catney back in, please? Pat, did you have a question? 
Hi. Well, no, well, no, it's okay. I think uh, I'm just trying to find out where I had it there. It was just to do with that £10.8 million, pounds, which had come back. And my, my question was going to be, how, how can the department, I've already asked the minister, he can't be, they can't, they're not certain that this money is going to be paid back. What's the engagement of the department undertaken with those companies? And uh, can they provide the names of the companies that have indicated their willingness to make these repayments, including the total rate relief that would be repayable? So, I mean, it's, I know it's 10.9 million, but this could grow to be more than that. But the chances are uh, there's no guarantee, and uh, we don't know if that's going to be paid back. And how else would be the reliance made on it? Okay. I know it's, it's, it looks like it's small, but I just don't think we can move on from that that quick. I think that we need to get better answers um, that, 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 that was given to us there on that. Okay. Thank you. So right in those terms, is that agreed? Yeah, I would agree that in turn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Sorry about that, Pat. I didn't actually see your uh, hand raised. but uh, So with this system, can not all the members of the committee be on permanently, or do they come on and come off? I think there were some technical issues there. I think Pat just uh, dropped out for a second, and they automatically put him in the audience. But they they restored him there when asked. All right, so it should be grand. So, Philip, can you hear us? Happy New Year to you. Welcome. Pulling <laughs> July. He's a decent broadband. <laughs> Looks like decent broadband at the bottom end of Glen Weary and a bit further up in Dunloy then. Ah, uh, well, it's decent, but could be better. Sure. <laughs> Fair local representation, that's what I mean. uh, Tell you what, there isn't any decent broadband at the top of Glen Wherry. I don't know about further down at where Jim is. <laughs> don't even go there. <laughs> it's just fine, thanks. <laughs> right, uh, let's move on. Draft minutes proceedings for the 16th of December. Four minutes of draft minutes are at page six. Uh, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? You spelt your name right this time, Gemma? Um, at least my name's in it this time. <laughs> <laughs> for which I apologise. It's okay. okay. <laughs> on behalf of the committee. Okay, thank you. And are we happy for the publish to be on the website? Great. Uh, matters arising, uh, June monitoring briefing. Draw members' attention to page 15 from the Committee for Infrastructure informing the committee of the Minister for Infrastructure's failure to brief the committee on January monitoring. Do we have any comments? Yes. Uh, Chair, I think it's almost close to my heart, given the amendment I made to Jim's bill, uh, functional government bill. This is this is uh, just another example of how departments do not treat committees with respect. And I'm glad that the, the the chairperson of that committee has written to us to keep us informed. And I think I agree with the the, the actions there as outlined uh, uh, by the in the paper uh, that we should keep on top of this. And make sure this does not happen again. Uh, you know, it's not hard to keep committees informed. It is not an arduous task. It's a very important task, in fact. So I, I am. This happens all the time, and it shouldn't. It just happens to be in this case, it's the infrastructure department and, and committee. Just, yeah. But next time it'll be another committee. Yeah. And it's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. Uh, and we need to, we need as a, a finance committee to clamp down on this. What I describe as bad behaviour. Okay. Um, I would like to seek your agreement, therefore, to write to the Minister of Infrastructure to outline the guidance of in year monitoring and public expenditure. Inform the extent and timing of the engagement is a matter for committees, not the departments, and ask the Minister on what basis it was considered appropriate to ignore the guidance and thus inhibit both the Committee for Infrastructure and indeed ourselves from undertaking the scrutiny functions. And I also think we should write to the minister, uh, our minister, to reinforce the guidance and seek assurance from all departments, bearing in mind that we have already seen an example of our own department sliding from what it should be, and inform the Committee for Infrastructure of the actions taken by the Committee for Finance. Are we content? Uh, I would just, my question would be, Chair, that we know about this, I believe, because the Infrastructure Committee um, this is not to justify or, or um, Offer an explanation. Uh, I don't know the circumstances around this, but um, we don't know whether other committees have had briefing. I mean, what I'm asking is, would it be worth our while writing to other committees to find out whether they were briefed by their um, respective departments? Uh, I think what would be useful is we info the other chairs of the other committees yeah. in the letter. So that should, uh, with an explanation note that's saying that we're doing this. 
because of the issues we've been raised by the Committee for Infrastructure, so that all the committees will be aware of the issue, and then it will be up to them to take where it comes from. But I think that procedurally covers that one and covers so that I, issue. What we are proposing is that we would copy the letter to the Minister to other to, part, to other committees. The other committee chairs, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, move on to uh, item 6.2, Public Procurement Common Framework. Uh, the committee wrote to the Committee for the Economy regarding the Public Procurement Common Framework. Uh, members at page 16, the Committee for Economy has responded. It welcomes this information and looks forward to further engagement on this matter as it progresses. I would invite you to note that issue. Thank you. Uh, as we have already briefed, the ARAP briefing session has been cancelled. And the next briefing session we have is with uh, Hugh Taylor, who is the Director of External Affairs from UCAS, and Professor Ali Najid, uh, Director of FARCERT at Ulster University. Do we have them up on? We do, Chairperson. And if I could ask Assembly Broadcasting to add Mr. Hugh Taylor and Professor uh, Najid into the uh, spotlight. Lovely. Yeah. And I just want to inform you that the Clark's briefing paper is page 68. Uh, the UCAS presentation is page 70, and the fire cert facades assessment and hazard identification in multi-storey buildings is page 73. And I would like to ask Chu and Ali, uh, thank you very much indeed for taking your time and coming on to Starleaf and talking to us. Uh, just for a piece of background, uh, we as a committee had been asked, even though we were the Department of Finance's committee, uh, we were asked to look at fire safety regulations, and particularly those that were returning to do with cladding. And obviously, with a lot of interest to do around Grenfell and some of the uh, uh, lobbying that was being made by uh, members of this committee, it has raised a considerable amount of interest to us. And one of the things that we've become aware as our investigations has continued, there is much more to this than uh, we are originally considered. And we would like to be fully briefed and fully understand the issues of something that is vitally important as this. And that is why I'm really glad that uh, both of you have been able to sort of give, our, give some presentations today. And uh, I would like to ask both of you, and um, whichever way you want to do it, please feel free to make your opening statements, and then I'll open it up for discussions for members of the committee. But thank you very much indeed. Ali, can you hear us? Mr. Taylor, can you hear us? And Professor Ali, can you hear us as well? I can hear. It is a little bit uh, broken up. Um, uh, I think the uh, chairperson has asked if you would like to make a, an opening statement if the uh, technology allows. Well, perhaps we start by go first. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Hugh Taylor uh, from the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. Uh, we are the national accreditation body and therefore we oversee organisations that issue certificates uh, uh, for uh, construction products and for services of various kinds. Uh, our remit is not just across construction, it is across the whole of, of industry, engineering and business. So that, that's, that's uh, um, my introduction very briefly. Okay. Professor? Sorry, Neil, could you get in contact with uh, broadcasting and see if they can help us out here? Sorry, members. If Hugh, Hugh since, you're, since you're still on and we, we still have a link, would you care to go ahead with your presentation um, and hopefully the technology will hold up? Yes, certainly, Chair. Um, my understanding, and please correct me if this is wrong, but the name of UCAS had cropped up on a number of occasions in your previous discussions. Uh, and you wanted to have a better understanding of who we are and what we do? Yes, indeed, and particularly in relation to uh, fire safety standards. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try, if I may, I believe we've got some papers in the pack, but I'm going to try, if I can, to share my screen, although I'm not massively uh, comfortable with your system, which I've never used before. <laughs> neither are we. Uh, neither are we. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so I'm struggling here. I, I, I will not share my screen. I think it's probably a bit better. Yeah. If I can point you to the, the, the very simple presentation, which I believe you've been circulated with, there is the one diagram particularly, the one slide I would particularly like to use to explain our role is the one with a, a pyramid diagram. Yeah, okay. Uh, and if I can just talk you through that very simply, if you start at the bottom, page the bottom of the page, page 71, Tim. Yeah. The bottom layer of that pyramid represents, as it says, product and system um, and uh, services providers. So those may be, for instance, manufacturers of fire doors. They may be uh, food production companies. Um, they, they may be engineering organizations of, of various kinds. Those organizations are ones that need a certificate so, for instance, a fireball manufacturer may need a certificate to prove the, uh, the quality or performance of the fire door. A food manufacturer may need a food safety certificate. So those organizations then have to approach third party organizations, which is the middle layer of that pyramid, which we tend to call conformity assessment bodies. But they are um, testing laboratories, certification bodies, inspection bodies, and they are third party experts who can issue certificates in certain areas. And then the role of UPAS at the very top of that pyramid is to provide oversight of those conformity assessment bodies. Uh, in very simple terms, we check the checkers and we are the sole national appointed government organization to provide that, uh, that oversight to organizations of various kinds. So I, I hope that diagram just sort of helps what, explain what we mean by UCAS's role and the terms accreditation, what UCAS applied to the conformity assessment bodies and certification, which is what the conformity assessment bodies provide manufacturers and service providers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor, can you hear us? Yes, I do. Uh, ah. Can you hear? Yes, we. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, while while the link is still up, can we invite you to go ahead with your presentation? Why we've still got the technology to allow us to continue? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let me first, you know, uh, give a brief uh, about what FireCert can do. The Institute of Fire Safety Engineering Research and Technology at the University of Ulster is nationally and internationally recognized for its excellence and its contribution to fire safety engineering and science as manifested with the award of six million prestigious grant from the EPSRC and UK government. And this grant created the UK and Europe's premier university research facility for fire safety, science and engineering. In general, our mission is to enhance the public safety and the competitiveness of UK industry through performance, prediction methods, measurement technology, and new fire safety material that assure improvement of life cycle quality, sustainability, and economy of the built environment. I'm back to you, Chairman. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you very, thank you very much indeed. I lost, I lost the voice. Ah, sorry. I think, I think we, if you don't mind, we'll push ahead with questioning why we can still keep keep the the various links up. Sorry, Tim. A bit. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I think we're probably struggling a bit with trying to get through in the communications, but I would just like to ask you both a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is why we would have, uh, we have had some evidence to suggest that Northern Ireland should be taking a separate route towards fire safety certification of certain materials from that followed by England. And we also understand that Scotland has taken a separate route. Is there, could you outline what your views are on that? 
and why Northern Ireland, which is a relatively small market, would be taking a different approach to that that's been taken in England and Wales? Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman. I think it's a very uh, articulated question related to regulation in Northern Ireland. I had the chance, of course, and always, to look at the regulation between England, Wales, and others in the United Kingdom, and main the, uh, mainly the uh, Northern Ireland. I looked at the regulation B, and the comparison with the document or approved document E of the uh, Northern Ireland, I do not see any particular huge difference in the regulation, except the names uh, given section rather than the requirement, and some words has been misplaced in the, in the title of the section compared to the requirement from B1 to B5. Uh, I accept few tables has been adjusted uh, in the way possibly the regulation fitted the constructions and also the building regulation in Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't agree with you, Chairman, when you say we are more compared to what's going on in the United Kingdom. But we may say we are lucky in a way that so many things is happening in the mainland compared to uh, our state here in Northern Ireland. So we are sort of really participating in the regulation in the United Kingdom and England and Wales. And of course, we should have sort of way uh, share the information with them and implement it as an appendix separate in our document E. And like this, we can extend even the amendment provided by the recent regulation change in the building regulation. Uh, that's what I can see. I know that Scotland is taking step forward to change the regulation uh, related to the sprinkler system dropped from 30 meter and to 11 meter. And I think uh, it's not to follow them. I think this is to all of us. Let's take it this way. If anything happened in the England, it's UK to participate in the regulation of the build, envi uh, build environment altogether. So I believe we are not sort of way uh, making any contribution in the England. So in that case, what we make a participation in the contribution, what is the amendment in the regulation in uh, England? It is the same should be done for Northern Ireland and of course for Scotland. And of course, we know Wales and England, they work together in the document. Okay. Okay. I have to say, I, I can see no particular reason why different parts of the United Kingdom should greatly differ in this respect. Um, you know, fire, fire behaves in the same way, whatever part of the United Kingdom uh, it happens to strike. I think ultimately, as, as the professor has mentioned, perhaps decisions can be made locally regarding, um, for instance, the number of stories or the height of the building that is affected. Um, yeah, and that potentially may be a decision that uh, devolved governments wish to make themselves. But I think in general terms, there should be no great difference uh, with the building regulations. I think, I think, Chairman, can I add something else, Chairman? Yes, certainly. Yes, uh, uh, we're not small. Let's take it this way. We, we developed, we implemented our knowledge in the Eurocode 1991, Part 1, Section 2, in related to localized fire, and next is coming the traveling fire, and even compartmentation, including the, the new sort of way beams which they use them for long span, which are sidereal with opening and so on. So our knowledge is all over the world. I can add other things too. We participated with the government of Australia, which is the science and organization 
industrial research and related to fatabs and we provided them knowledge and are using it. Also, we worked with Japan in facades as well, China in facades as well. We participated in all sorts of knowledge in science. And I think there is nothing which sort of way should eliminate us to implement and, imp and add what can be added in the document E of Northern Ireland. If we are participating all over the world, that means we are big, we do exist, and we participate even in the, uh, in the document by Judy, and also in the uh, document B amendment. So in that case, we are part of it, and we do have the right to add it to our regulation E here. Jim, the master. Is that me? Yep. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Obviously, public safety is everyone's primary concern. So my question is relatively simple. <coughs> is it necessary in respect of building cladding to have an absolute ban on combustibles, or is it possible to have an adequate testing system which makes some cladding suitable? So if the choice is between an absolute ban or an approved testing system, which do you prefer? If I take it uh, through my way, I have to make sure that all the materials which has to be used in the facade has to be non-combustible or limited combustibility. Mm. But having said that, it should be a system to test the assembling all elements together to see if the facade responds as a, as a mechanism altogether doesn't fail to some criteria provided by the BS 8414, either part one or part two, depending on the building structure of the building. So answering to your questions, first I have to make sure also there are two options, either you satisfy all the elements are non-combustible, or you go to the test and check it following the regulation. In my view, we have to check first that materials and the next phase we have to make the assembling element as a system to be tested to be sure that we fulfill all the requirement either one or two and can a laboratory test be at a large scale or a small scale one confidently compare to the actuality of what could happen uh, out on the ground that's a good question. Uh, I think in 2012, uh, it was a comparison between the existing assembling system of facades between different countries, between the BS standard, because be, be, the German standard, the Republic, and the ISO standard, which is international one. And it came that there is similarities, but the, the most close to the practicality one is the British standard. I, uh, I do have the uh, evidence here in front of me that the British standard comes as a strong candidate to be used in even beyond UK and Europe. And I think the recent assessment of last year, which I participated for the facade assessment for the first test to be taken as it was the British standard. And does that mean that therefore if it is adequately met, you don't need a ban? Say that again because your voice goes and comes. If the British standard is satisfactorily met, does that mean you do not need to have a ban? Yes. If it's are you confident, are you if it, confident 
that the testing is wholly reliable? Well, if the system, if the system is tested with the right manner, with the right uh, qualified uh, staff working in the lab, with the right uh, checking, and of course with the UCAT, I should not. It should not be problems. I would feel more confident with that. I'll tell you what, I think because your question is very good. There are people confusing between the BS 841 part one and part two. And this is the role for the building control to check if which one has to be, is uh, compliant with the regulation. Is it one or two? I tell you, I have seen two in one and one in two. So they have to be very careful. As long as there is one and two, it should be specific for that particular geometry of this building. They should not say two is more risky or one, it's okay. It should not happen this way. So I think this question was asked previously. Uh, I heard that it related to fraud in sort of way. That, that could be fraud if you test one and the criteria is two, and you pass it to the building control and it's approved, that's, that's a big mistake. Thank you. OK, thanks, Professor. Jim, other um, Jim. I think we're, we're, we're two nations divided by one Zoom call. I, I, I have missed, uh, because of the technical issues, I've missed some of what you've said. But just as the amount of cladding in Northern Ireland is relatively small, what would be the implications if we simply took a decision there will be no more cladding on any building in Northern Ireland above, say, eight metres? And therefore, the whole issue of whether to test or not to test becomes epidemic, <coughs> academic. What would be the implications if we simply did that? Uh, it, it's a good question, to be honest with you. Uh, at the moment, uh, we uh, we are having... Um, a proposal with the Northern Ireland uh, Housing Executive to assess all the hazards uh, existing in the 33 building which was selected. And we are going to make uh, an assessment and also of the uh, identification of the multi-story building. And within that, come with the matrix, and from the matrix, we can sort of way bring the concern point in order possibly to add it in our Appendix E because it's going to be related to the construction here in Northern Ireland. This will help a lot to the uh, design concept for the future of multi-story building in Northern Ireland. That will bring, uh, let's say, Appendix E or the document E or the booklet E, as people sometimes they uh, they make it different. I think it will give us a robust uh, document in order to believe that we are doing it safe, and it should not be a worrying point to our society if we are using beyond six floor and using the cladding panel, as you said. But what? what what would be the practical difficulties if we just said, we're not interested in the ambiguity or testing, we're just going to ban it? Are there any problems? I mean, it, it, it clearly is not that popular in Northern Ireland. There seems to be lots of buildings in the province without it. So why, in the interest of simplicity, be just saying no new buildings will have cladding? I think this is uh, a question to, uh, to, be, uh, to be sort of a collective answer because uh, we do have the industry, and the industry provides combustible and non-combustible and limited combustible materials. And all this has to be in construction, but with some limitation. We cannot uh, say, in my point of view, yes, in regulation, we could say beyond 18 meters, no combustible material. Uh, there, is no, there is no comment on that. The regulation is very stiff, and it's there. But below that, you got sprinkler system, so you have to add the technology as well. So the technology can help a lot during for the evacuation, 
and to reduce the fire to travel from the compartmentation through the opening to the external facade. So there is a way how sort of way reduce the high risk. We should not rely on one thing and ignore the other thing. We should work all together. I think I got that. Did you, did you, I didn't hear the last bit. I, 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 could you just repeat the last sentence, please? I could, the Zoom went again. I said the regulation is clear that the non-combustible material should not be provided beyond 18 meter. Non-combustible, non-combustible above 18 meters. That's correct. The no combustible material beyond 18 meter. The technology exists in order to reduce the risk uh, here in Northern Ireland and other places as well. So the sprinkler system was dropped, which is good way, from 30 meter up to 11 meter, and 11 meter is less than 18 meter. That means the flame spread could be eliminated before it's achieved that level. So the technology can help a lot for to stop the fire to spread from the compartmentation to the facade, and it helped a lot for the evacuation of people to sort of way be safe and not to be trapped by the smoke and the heat inside the building. Got that. Got okay. that. Yeah. Happy with that, Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, Q, Ali, thank you very much indeed, and I apologise for the communications links, and, but I think if we have any further questions, can we write to you and you can reply written answers rather than us trying to rely on a, a rather poor, poor communications link today, which I apologise for. Uh, but both of you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your time. and. Uh, as I say, uh, we're, yeah, I'm having it too, Alec. The, sort of, the communications is not working particularly well. But thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm sorry for that, uh, Committee. I think, uh, our, and if anybody's been trying to follow what's been going on in the Executive Committee as well, uh, they've been having similar problems with um, Starleaf. So uh, there's obviously something going on. We move on to the next item of the agenda. Do you know what you know, those days we just, you know, I should have stayed at home and tried to come on in Glenware. Actually, Jim, Jim Allister and I and Philip, we could have all stood about sort of 20 metres apart from each other and got all this done much easier. Right, let's move on to item number nine. Uh, Statute Rule 2020-332, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restrictions on Forfeiture Relevant Period. Northern Ireland Number 3 Regulations 2020. Um, one of the things I want to discuss about this uh, team as we go through, we've already heard from the Minister today about the extension of rates relief. This takes the extension of rates relief, which I believe we'll have no difficulties in agreeing to today, out to the end of the financial year. But the question I think we should be asking is, bearing in mind this is the case, and I think the Minister has already indicated he would like to see about $150 million going towards extending it out. I would probably like to ask the question from the committee, and I'll put it to you formally at the end of this, once we've done the formal part of this, that we write to them and look at putting it out to uh, the end of uh, out to the end of the second quarter of, of uh, 2021, which takes sort of businesses through sort of quarter one and takes it through the summer period as well, which I think would also tie in what the minister is trying to do. I think that would be an appropriate relief for many of our businesses who are trying to struggle through. But it sends a strong message that the executive is interested in them maintaining their survival and looking at the success, or hopefully the success, of the vaccination programme. That would tie in with what could potentially be a reasonable summer for a lot of our businesses. Kevin, I strongly agree with you. Um, presumably, there will be a speech drafted for you or a response to the minister's statement on Monday. Yep. It might be worth including that just to get that publicly aired. Will be a question that the the, the uh, chairperson will have, and hopefully the speaker won't cut across the uh, chair. But uh, I am I sure I have, I have, I have no speaker. I have no issues with getting through to the speaker to get that one across, <laughs> as you probably well aware. The speaker normally allows a bit of attitude to the committee chairs. I would I would go for I I will I will <coughs> and indeed if it wasn't I would raise it in my I would raise it in my uh, party remarks anyhow. Yeah. 
but I think it's appropriate that we do too. And I think I, that would be the desire of the committee. Great. Okay, let's go through this. I inform the members that the purpose of the rule is Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 provides the right of re-entry of forfeiture under relevant business tenancy for non-payment of rent not to be enforced by actions otherwise during the relevant period. The relevant period for the purpose of the Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 from 31 December 2020 to 31 December or 21 March 2021. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure of the Assembly. We considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 9th of December. Our content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. Uh, the Department had indicated it will be necessary to break the 21-day convention in respect to the rule to allow ongoing harmonisation with the policy position in Britain. The examiner of statutory rules has reported on the statutory rule and indicated that she is content with the Department's explanation in this regard. Are we content? Therefore, the members are content to say that the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2020 number 332, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restriction on Forfeiture, Relevant Period, Northern Ireland number 3, Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. We move on to Statutory Rule 2020-342, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Airports Regulation, Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, draw members to the following papers relating to the agenda item of the Clark's paper on page 92. Uh, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Airports Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, page 100. There's an issue that comes up with this um, uh, with this rule because now we're into this uh, brave new world of the protocol about it comes on to state aid rules and the implications of state aid rules, particularly when we're dealing with this is the issue of the EU. Um, one of the things I would like us to do as a committee after we have agreed to the statutory rule is to write to the department to ask them for clarification on the state aid rules and the state aid rules position at the moment, because I'm not certain, and I don't know if you, but I would imagine, like all of us, when we were doing our Christmas reading, we avidly read every piece of documentation that came through, but I don't really have any clarity of what those state aid rules are, and I would probably like those, because this is not the first time this will come up, and I think it would be appropriate if we were suitably informed. Are we content on that? Great. Okay. So, I uh, inform the members the rule is made in order to ensure expedited financial assistance to Belfast City Airport and Belfast International Airport. Organisations would continue to be significantly affected by the impacts of COVID-19. The purpose of the rule is to allow for the provision of up to $7.8 million in total of temporary financial support to Belfast International Airport and Belfast City Airport. The rule indicates that all monthly losses will be covered rather than the 70 per cent of this was case previously though this is subject to no staff being made redundant and no dividends being paid to shareholders and state aid considerations. That is the question we need to keep ourselves informed about going forward. Uh, the rule is subject to negative re resolution procedure of the Assembly and current operation of the 21st of December 2020. We considered the SL1 and its meeting on the 16th of December and were content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The Department has indicated it would be necessary to break the 21-day convention in respect of the rule due to its urgency, and we were writing to the examiner's statutory rules to highlight this fact. The SR has subsequently reported to the on the statutory <coughs> rule and indicated that she accepts the Department's explanation. Are we content? Therefore, the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2023 the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Airports Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objections to this rule. Agreed. Are we agreed? Agreed. Move on to Statutory Rule 2023-54, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2, Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. I draw your attention to the letter from the Minister of Finance regarding the uh, amendment, page 102. Uh, the Statutory Rule 2023-54, No. 2, page 104. Examiner's Statutory <coughs> Rules Report on page 109, and the Clerk's Briefing on page 117. These regulations amend the executive support packages for businesses implemented through the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland in order to reflect the amendments made by the Department of Health Legislation. To the fact that, uh, draw mention to the fact that the Committee did not consider an SL1. The Minister of Finance has written to the Committee to draw attention to the fact that the rules contain to reflect the Committee's policy agreement at SL1 stage in respect to the Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, given at the meeting on 21 October 2020 and the subsequent clearance of the formal statute rule by the Committee on 4 November 2020. The Minister that advises that, due to the urgent need to provide pandemic support for the businesses, he has adopted this approach. 
advise members that the new statutory rule appears to define certain businesses, e.g. guest houses and bed and breakfast, and indicates that the level of support payments available. I would like to advise you that the ESR has lately reported on the table, and she advises that in Regulation 2H, the word regulation should be paragraphed, and the Department has confirmed that will, be, that will correct the error at the earliest opportunity. The SR has no other comments on the rule. The DLO has advised that their error is minor. And in view of the circumstances, I think we would be content to agree to that. Content. And if we are content to the, the uh, overall rule, therefore, uh, the Committee for Finance has considered <coughs> Statutory Rule 202354, Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2, Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objections to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, inform members of the 17th report of the Examiner's Statutory Rules, Session 2020-21, was published on the 16th of December 2020. And I would like to draw members' attention to Statutory Rule 2020-308, Rate Relief Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The ESR did not draw attention of the Assembly to this rule. I would like members to note, so noted. noted. Chairperson's business, item number 12. There is no chairperson's business. Uh, if we move on to correspondence. Uh, correspondence cover sheet uh, is the correspondence cover sheets, page 121. Uh, the dormant accounts from the Department indicating that is to provide quarterly updates on the dormant accounts from, from April 2021. The relevant fund open for applications to the 12th of January 2020. It's on page 123. Members, do we have any comments? But just to say, Mr Chairman, I, I, I raised this issue and, of course, things have moved on. Uh, the fund has been announced uh, and uh, bids are now being requested in the Department have advertised its existence. I've seen that. Yep. I have no doubt whatsoever there will be considerable interest in this, particularly from bodies who up to now have not, on principle, been able to claim from the Lottery Fund, though interestingly enough, it is actually the Lottery Fund that is administering it. Uh, but um, I think it was the principle of money coming from gambling was an issue with some churches. So um, a quarterly report is more than adequate, given the fact that things have moved on so well since I raised this. Okay, and thank you very much indeed. And may I sort of record our thanks to uh, the member of the committee, Wells, for his sort of pushing of this issue and where we've got to as well. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the business rate support, uh, 150 million pounds business rate support. Department, uh, as we've already discussed, the department is seeking flexibility from HM Treasury to allow the 150 million pound to be carried over to 2021-22 in order to provide business rate support. The minister has a comment on this as part of the January monitoring round statement. I think we have discussed that and noted it. Um, 13.4. NISRA recruitment underspend. The tar departmental response regarding recruitment underspend referring to delays related to COVID and a lengthy NICS recruitment process. Um, seven months to recruit somebody. Um, I'm not suggesting for one moment, committee, that this is something that bureaucrats might be using as a method of making sure that they stay within their sort of quarterly monitoring rounds. But it just seems to me uh, it is a particularly prolonged process. And I think one of the things we might invite um, uh, when we're looking at NICS, HR and the processes, are there any guidelines and details about uh, timings, particularly of recruitment process and what those should be? Uh, because this does seem to be a rather excessive period of time, bearing in mind that uh, NISRA has been hunting particularly for people. Do we have any comments? Okay. Good to note. Uh, Matthew, uh, the next piece is a copy of correspondence from the House of Lords European Union Select Committee to Michael Gove, commenting on the implementation and the operation of the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, page 129. I'd like to advise members that the House of Lords EU Committee will be seeking the views of Assembly Committees on relevant issues, including how mechanisms for operating parallel EU and UK VAT systems for goods and services will work in practice. And I note that um, Michael Gove today made a statement in uh, Parliament saying that the VAT issues in dealing with second-hand cars being brought across from BB to Northern Ireland had miraculously been waived. Even though we don't know what the VAT issues are, we don't know what the VAT processes are, and we haven't been given any details or any information on this particular piece. So I, for one, would like to have some clarity on what the EU and UK VAT systems for goods and services will work in practice. 
Uh, they also questioned about the legal status of the various unilateral declarations, including the clarification to the protocol state aid provisions, and I think we have already identified that as something we need to get some clarity on. The mechanisms for parliamentary scrutiny of the work of the Joint Committee and the draft EU legislation applying to Northern Ireland under the scope of the protocol. I would also like to expand that out, the discussions about the role of the Specialist Committee, what is the role of the arbitration panel and who is likely to be on that arbitration panel, and what is the role of the Partnership Council, which seems to have something that has crept into the lexicon that I am not particularly aware of where it sits, but I think those are all important things for Northern Ireland. And I think a further issue we need to ask, and bearing in mind that the Department of Finance holds the departmental solicitors, is indeed the question of the primacy of the European Court of Justice and how that works within legislation of Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland process, because I think clarity on uh, that issue is fundamental, for we understand particularly the role of the Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly, where our role is, but also indeed in our dealings with the European Court of Justice and how that interrelates both with the Supreme Court and the Northern Ireland legal system. And this will be particularly vital when we are dealing with trade issues and a whole, the, the whole raft of the gamut of the protocol. Uh, is there anything else we would like to add onto that uh, list? Matthew, you probably uh, agree with the Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Matthew first and then Pat. Um, I agree a lot with the, actually with a lot of that, Chair. I think it is important. I suppose my question is, are, are we... Are, is the suggestion that we write back to the House of Lords Committee saying that we, we do need clarity on uh, a lot of this um, has emerged very late on. We got progress in the Joint Committee on certain things, on certain easements. We then got the FTA very late, and alongside the FTA we got, as I say, agree agreement on easements and the emergence of a few new bodies, both in terms of the operation of the protocol and also in terms of the broader EU UK relationship we could do I think in the assembly generally with um, more clarity on how we are all going to scrutinise and that actually applies to whatever you think of Brexit and whatever you think of the protocol so there shouldn't be any um, fuss about that as it were we should we should all we should all want that um, specifically in relation to VAT I think it, it, it's we do need well, there have been notes published on how it works, but it's because VAT's inherently complicated. It's inherently complicated. The issue around used cars, I suspect, will be an easier one to solve. Uh, hopefully, it'll be an easier one to solve, and it's good that that clarity came today from um, from a minister, from Michael Gove. Um, uh, I suspect there will be other challenges that won't be as easy to solve. In part, that one is because there's a relatively small market for right-hand drive cars outside the island of Ireland and the EU. So. There's a there's one uh, limited market distortion, but yes, I mean I agree that we need clarity on lots of these things. But it would be, uh, I suppose, one one uh, some of that will have to come from TU as well. Okay, thank you. And of course, the Maltese and the Cypriots might disagree with you slightly. Exactly, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's, there aren't too many. It's, uh, you need to be pretty entrepreneurial to want to get a, a, a Nissan Micra from Larne <laughs> or Rosslare to Valletta. But I'm sure we've got <laughs> opportunities in Brexit. Opportunities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Writing to Dolph about the hierarchy yep. issue, but then writing to the, we, because the request was from the, the House of Lords EU Committee, will be seeking the views of Assembly Committees. So our view is that we're, we we don't we don't know we want information on this. That's it. We want information, effect. but we should probably detail some of the areas that we do as already in mind. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay, if we move on to the next item, uh, uh, sorry, 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 uh, Pat, sorry, uh, sorry, apologies. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, just on the back of what Matthew has said, I just want to make. My Oscar uh, colleagues, as David Brown, don't know where this goes or where it sits, but he has been informed that there has been a duty, a, a, a quite hefty duty rise increase on uh, steel uh, coming in here to Northern Ireland. Now, I don't have all the facts on it, but he informed me that it could be as much as £3 million per annum. Is that something that we could bring up with the Select Committee as well? Thank you. Yeah, I think I think we can we can we, we can raise the issue. But if we could get some more specific details, because this does speak to uh, the issue around about VAT and VAT systems, and obviously if the the tariff would probably apply to steel that's been brought in from outside either the UK, UK or the EU, 
and that's potentially the reason why the tariff has gone up. But we need to get some more details about this and sort of yeah. the finishing of it. Um, Move on to the next item for the Committee for the Executive Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister highlight concerns re regarding Committee scrutiny of common frameworks, page 131. Uh, draw members' attention to page 2 in the fourth bullet point referring to the Committee of Finance and the Public Procurement Framework. Do we have any comments? Happy to note. Uh, from the Committee of the Executive Office to the Department for Finance regarding EU structural funds at the end of the transition period and the implications for Northern Ireland. The Committee is seeking a breakdown of the funds concurrently provided in Northern Ireland, page 135. Uh, obviously, we have heard from the Minister that he is still seeking clarity about what the funding is likely to be, as well as coming from the other regions. Um, do we have any other comments? Uh, I'd like to seek your agreement to ask the department to copy the response to the committee, if we can. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask a question here? We get a lot of these sort of routine um, correspondence between committees. Um, the vast bulk of them are non-contentious, and I'm just wondering, could they not be agreed by the chair and the deputy chair, rather than a whole list of these coming before us week after week, in the sense that there's going to be a lot more of this with Brexit? And I've never seen any of them being contentious. Do we actually have to put them on the agenda, or can we not leave it to the, the two highly experienced uh, chair and deputy chair just to deal with them and put them through? I would be delighted to do that. However, um, Jim, I think one of the reasons why, and having been sort of in some other committees before, is that correspondence that had been either waved through or had been dealt with by. Uh, the chair and the deputy chair and uh, other members of the committee felt as if that they had not been kept fully informed of the discussion. And I appreciate I appreciate the timings and the timelines, but I think um, I'm quite happy to just read you through some of the correspondence that is coming through. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at my my able deputy who's nodding his head. But we're not, I'm not saying that committees that they still go in the papers, but we don't have to take a decision by decision. If a member wants to call one in, fine, but just note that the chair and the deputy chair have agreed X, Y, and Z. And, uh, it's just uh, uh, these keep coming up to us. We seem to get them all because we're the Department of Finance Committee, so therefore everything comes to us. And all you're asking is for permission to copy material. No one's ever going to oppose that. Through my experience, as Jim has alluded to, I, I, I would be uncomfortable uh, delegating the power to the deputy, to the chair and the deputy chair. And I, I do think, for open and transparency, we all should see them. Uh, on the point about the the function and how we get through them, it's only really bad at, uh, when we come off recess. So that's why you've got this big, extensive list. It's not the case every week. So I do think, for thoroughness, the chair should go through them. They have all their Ten times, other committees had has said basically, look, see your tabled uh, papers. Uh, does anyone want to raise anything, or do, are you all agreed with the actions uh, uh, with regards to the tabled uh, uh, paper, uh, which grips all the correspondence together and gives a description? Uh, but sometimes things can be missed, and, and whilst something may not be contentious for one member, it may be of interest to another. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for thoroughness, for the sake of an extra 15, 20 minutes, I do think we should go through. Uh, that's just me, of course. Okay. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Bo both, both your views have been noted. Right. Uh, just, to, just to be aware that Nilga and Solis are coming to talk to us next week, and part of that conversation will be about the EU structural funds. Uh, next item, an EU affairs manager response from the Treasury to the House of Lords Committee regarding a European Union proposal for regulation to establish the EU single window environment for customs. Again, uh, that's on page 137. And obviously, uh, that again brings under the question about the whole gamut of EU regulations and how it, and how it affects us. Uh, I'm just asking your agreement to note. Uh, from the Department of Response to the Company's Inquiry to Land and Property Service regarding turnaround times for funding scheme queries. Department very quick. This is a quick comment. This is why it's important that we on the single the, the letter from so the letter that we're noting from Jesse Norman to the chair of the Lords, the chair of the EU committee in the Lords is dated the seventeenth of December, which is before yep. the deal was done. Yeah, exactly. So you would hope that they, in terms of the relationship and all that, this is 
I'm Changed just, by the tacker. Yeah, and, and we hope this is what we all want, that, that these... Yeah. Okay. Um, sir, the Department of Finance refers to a very large number of queries. Members might just know that the total monies paid was around 56 million in December, and then increased dramatically to 113 million by January. Uh, I think, for many of us, we've seen that the department has really pulled the stops out to try and to try to get that done. And I, uh, as we've already alluded and passed on to the the minister, our thanks for uh, people being able being able to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah right. Well, there's those words, of course, we, we will because of uh, what we already stated earlier on the meeting to the minister. Um, I, I have never ever recognised this named official that we were all meant to go through. I, I, I've always went to the top and let it sprinkle <laughs> down. What was the named official? I, I've, I've always went to the top and let it sprinkle down. So I don't know who, who this unnamed or named official should be. Um, and and I, I guess that's how people have run into difficulties, I would suggest. Uh, but, you know, Whilst I am fully supportive and commend the work of LPS, I have very little sympathy uh, for them with regards to all these queries, because ultimately, and here is the problem with a lockdown mentality and policy, you take a, away a person's right to earn a living, and then you have to provide support. The government department that complains that it's been overwhelmed, they should really be in my world and listen to the people who have been refused the right to earn a living. Uh, so it's about getting these people support as quickly as possible. Thank you. Well, I would just take a slightly different view. And I mean, obviously, if I had the power of the deputy chairman of this committee, I'm sure all the officials quake when they see the name through at the end of any letter. But as an obscure, humble backbencher of many years, I have found there's often been very good reasons why there's been delay or refusal. I'll have to be honest with you. And I found that I've, when I work with the department, they do get the situation resolved. Uh, and therefore, I, I think they're being more careful this time round for very obvious reasons. I think there have been a lot fewer mistakes made because mm. it hasn't been as rushed. And the, uh, to be honest with you, I think that some of the, the, the terms of the agreement is quite generous and will cover the costs of businesses, particularly in the January, February period when things have been very quiet. The money is much appreciated. There was an announcement made by the Chancellor that there would be an additional one off £9,000 payment to businesses. Now, I haven't heard anything more about that, and I'm wondering, is that coming our way? And is that on top of the localised uh, payments? Or is it... Hello, it's, dead, it's dead off. Mm. <coughs> right, go ahead, Pat. No, sorry, no sec. Well, Pat, you're right in the middle of the hospitality industry. You might be aware do we know if the £9,000 grant is coming Northern Ireland's way, in the similar way we had the 10000 and the 25000 grants in April and May? Um, and is that on top of the localised payments, coronavirus payments, or is that instead of? That's the question that some businesses are asking me. And thirdly, what has happened to the director's payments, uh, which were promised before Christmas, and there doesn't seem to have anything that's actually been ruled out to those directors who didn't qualify because they weren't either employees or self-employed, yeah. um, single owners mostly. Where, where's that all gone? The yeah, Department of Economy is on the on the director's payments. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of the interesting questions was: you'll notice that the minister uh, there was a, there was a point where the chancellor said there would be additional. Uh, monies and the Secretary of State mentioned there'd be additional monies coming to Northern Ireland, and the Minister said no, there wasn't. This was money that had already been accounted for, and there is a dispute whether it is money that's already been accounted for or money that has it is new money. So we haven't had clarity on that, and indeed, I think I've got a question in to uh, I think I've got a question into the Minister to uh, ask that question whether it is in fact new money or not. So, uh, if, with the indulgence of the committee, if you can wait until my, my response comes to me, maybe that might give you give give you some answers along along those lines. Okay. I think Jim Alistair has a question. Jim. Yeah, returning to the correspondence that we're discussing, um, if I recall correctly, I think I had a hand in raising that. I, I'm a bit surprised by some of the response. My office was given the specific name of an identified official to contact and that was the system that I was complaining wasn't working mm -hmm. and continues to be 
far more tardy than when there was more direct access to LPS. Mm -hmm. So I don't entirely accept this response. There was an official named, at least to my office, but that system was not as good as its predecessor. Thank you. Pat? Pat? And that's Assembly Broadcasting put Pat Catney back into the spotlight. <laughs> Moyer calling, Moyer calling. <laughs> Thank you. Look, I'm sorry, that was a, an accident uh, just from my own. I'm on my phone here and I'm trying to work with tablet as well. And it's difficult enough, but look, I just wanted to state that LPS as well, do you know what I mean? And, and I, we, I raised it myself in, in the chamber for businesses which have a reasonable value of 51,000. Yeah. That money also has not got out. None of them have got that yet. So yes, we did get the we did get the 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 twenty five and the smaller rateable the the thirty six or whatever that money the other one was. But those that find themselves in a rateable valuation of fifty one thousand have absolutely got nothing yet. Okay. Right. We can tend to move on. Yeah. We've agreed to note. So I agree to note. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item: the department response regarding update on the engagement with the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents. The Department of Finance indicate that it's asked TEO to designate a responsible department. Do we have any comments? Yeah, Chair. This is this is nowhere near fast enough. Uh, the meeting with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and the Finance Minister took place on the fourth of November. Yeah. Those people are still still crying out for money. But not only the affiliated businesses, but also independents. I have a number of independent travel agents in my constituency, and Jim knows them well, because uh, they've yeah. corresponded, corresponded with, with all of us. And those people, usually independents, usually individual people or families, yeah. have had to use all their savings yeah. to pay out for refunds of holidays that didn't take place, and have no capacity left to survive. It is, if there's one group of businesses that really are suffering, it's independent travel agents because of the layout that they've had to do with aborted holidays. And it's a disgrace that there has, there's not even a department yet allocated to try and get around the idea of giving them some sort of support. It's diabolical and it's not good enough and it needs to be done much faster. I agree absolutely with that. I think it is quite a disgrace the manner in which they've been treated. Okay. Um, so the correspondence we had, are we uh, are we happy to forward it to the Committee for the Economy for information, but using the information and uh, expressing the sentiments that we've had expressed here today, to ask the Department to keep both committees updated on progress and express our concern that this meeting took place in November and we still haven't had any uh, yeah, well, here's the impact, Chair. If there's still a department to be allocated, which then yeah. has to come up with a support scheme, yeah. which then has to bid, and we're, by, we're now past January morning round, basically. Yeah. How are they getting the money? And, and how are they going to get money to support those businesses at this time? It's diabolical. It's, it's crazy. Thank you. Yeah. Chair, can, can I say, I think the target here has to be the executive office. It's they who would have to uh, allocate it. a department, mm -hmm. and that's where the tardiness seems to be. So I think we shouldn't just be saying to the Department of Economy what's happening. We should be saying to the Executive Office, why is the department not been allocated? Yeah. yeah. Great. Content. Great. Uh, moving on to the next one, the Department response regarding the Common Framework and Statistics, page 144. Do we have any comments, and are we happy to forward the correspondence to the EU Affairs Manager for information? Happy? Uh, from the Department regarding changes to the Civil Service Nationality Rules. Uh, the new rules will define relevant, relevant Europeans who work in the NI Civil Service as those Europeans who have, who have leave to remain in the UK. These rules do not apply to Irish citizens of page 146. Do we have any comments? Gemma? Matthew? No? OK. Happy to note. note. From the Department, this is uh, 1313. Departments are holding response regarding dilapidation payments. In consideration of changes to legislation, uh, do we have any comments? If not, are we happy to forward to Lindsay Chartered Surveyors and RICS for comment 
for information and thank them for the attention to this matter. Great. Uh, from the Department, a further update on the localised restriction support scheme. Uh, over £113 million has been paid to businesses. Uh, members, do we have any comments? Happy to note. Um, from thir- uh, item number 15, Sparrow Hosting, regarding the reported uh, Ulster Bank application to the High Court to transfer its business holdings to its parent Nat West. Uh, I have concerns about what is happening within the Northern Ireland banking sector and the move from – this is obviously the um, – the final stage of Ulster Bank uh, being split away from the, the business it had in the Irish Republic, but now looking at moving Ulster Bank to fully come under NatWest. There are implications here for the Northern Ireland banking sector and how it is uh, becoming quite monopolistic in its approach. And whereas I am asking members uh, if they have any further comments, I think this is something that we need to keep on our horizon. And one of the big issues we might have, particularly the Ulster Bank, is the movement of jobs that are currently in Belfast might be co- moved back into Edinburgh, bearing in mind if the Ulster Bank just becomes a, a, a rebranded part of NatWest and the implications to do that as well. I'm asking your agreement to note, but I would also like us to keep this on our scanning horizon of areas that are likely to come about. Matthew? Uh, I agree. I think there's and I think it may be something more for the economy committee, but I do think the Northern Ireland banking sector faces a real challenge, um, some of which is uh, connected, some of which people have the idea is related to Brexit, I think, because of, um, uh, because of um, leaving the single market for services will create challenges. Many of our, our, of our four big banks, traditionally big banks, Three of them are um, obviously headquartered in the south. They're all Ireland. The other one is part of what was RBS Group, now Nat West Group. There are uh, large and small key political factors that have that affect investment decisions in all in in the three of the four banking groups. I'm talking about AIB, Bank of Ireland, Nat West, RBS. Um, obviously, Danske is the exception. Um, I would have concerns about uh, where all of them are in terms of their strategic long-term commitment to here, uh, both in terms of branch network and also lending volumes, and I think they are really important questions that we should be um, asking. I'm not sure it's for our committee to ask them, but I, but I, but I do. Um, now, obviously, the banking sector generally is moving online. That's a phenomenon happening everywhere, but I do think there are questions to be asked. Um. What I was going to, what I would propose, and obviously, so as time is marching on, but I would like to, with your approval, I would like to write to the chair of the economy committee yeah, and highlight so. our concerns about the Northern Ireland banking sector and the, the likely implications of uh, Ulster Bank um, coming further under uh, NatWest RBS, RBS NatWest. There are also issues to do with Danske and the future ownership and where Danske sits as well. And bearing in mind the positions of the sort of the banking sector in Northern Ireland, and I would like, with your approval, to and strategic to reviews by both AIB and Bank of, ba- Bank of Ireland is in the middle of a strategic review, and we don't know where that where that's going to take them in relation to the north. So. Yeah, and it, and the implications that that might have for the wider sort of business. Yeah. Okay. So just and on the back of that, it's just quite recently that we've got the APG up on on fair banking, and I myself had met with the banks, and I realised. As Matthew has stated there, that they themselves find themselves under great pressure. But there is no doubt that their level of um, engagement with us is well noted. And the one that probably came forward the most and was the most helpful uh, before we uh, got really into the, the resolution you know, for the, the commerce on, on banking and the settlement process, which is now in place, thankfully, in Northern Ireland, was the Northern Bank. Danska. 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 Danska, sorry, Danska, that's what I meant to say, sorry. You showed your age, uh, Bank of Northern, Belfast. But I've <laughs> given away my age, but sorry about that, Danska Bank, thank you. Okay, thank you. We can t- sorry, just for info, members, uh, I th- my understanding is banking is reserved, but insofar it as it affects the furtherance of the trade sure. of Northern Ireland, then it's definitely devolved. It's so definitely it's, devolved. Yeah, it is yeah. reserved. But it's, it is. Yeah. Um, and two items, of final, finally, two items of correspondence from the Committee for the Economy, one on the end of COVID schemes and the one of air connectivity. Uh, I'll take them both together. Do we have any comments and are we happy to note? 
Uh, seek agreement to note the committee's uh, composite information request. Uh, the information request in the Department asks for extension of a response regarding VAT payable and PP imported from the EU to Northern Ireland. Still haven't had a response on that? I, I think we've had a response from someone else about VAT, uh, but I, my understanding is we actually have another department yet. Okay, can we give them a yeah. uh, gentle prod? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, a non gentle prod. We've already given them one gentle prod. Now it's a, sort of a more of a shove. Okay. Okay. Uh, response to the Department of Appellation of Payments has been received. Yep. And uh, to note the routine paper circulated on the 8th of January 2021. Thank you. Yep. Move quickly on to the forward work programme. Forward work, work programme for January to April is at page 162. Building Control Northern Ireland have agreed to give oral evidence regarding the amendment to the building regulations on the 3rd of February. Uh, are we agreed to receive that oral evidence on the 3rd of February? Agreed. Uh, remind members that the committee received all departmental bids for capital and resource funding, uh, both COVID related and otherwise, previously agreed to raise, forward to raise to conduct analysis. Are we content? Yep. And to ask the department to provide further details of all COVID-19 related bids and other bids submitted in the January monitoring round and forward to this to raise on receipt for analysis. Are we content? Content. Chairman, I don't know if it's one for any other business, but I was going to return to a previous matter from matters arising that relates to this. Do you want me, can I do it now? Or? Uh, do it now then. Wait. So um, uh, it just relates to our, our discussion on the infrastructure committee. My understanding is that the, the department actually had that, the committee had their evidence session today on the infrastructure department monitoring round. Um, so it would, I suppose there's a question about whether there's any point in sending a, a, a letter solely to the committee if they've had their evidence session today. But more generally, I wonder if there is a concern about monitoring around scrutiny, would it, be a, a, would it be a question for us to write to all committees and ask them for an update on what they've had in terms of monitoring around? Have they, you know, we don't know, for example, we know that today the infrastructure department... No, the infrastructure had theirs today. Had theirs today. Okay. Uh, I must have been, I, I don't know, I haven't had reports back from our, through our party, from our party spokesperson on which, which departments have had and which hadn't. So, yeah. I think chairperson, that was what the committee actually agreed. We're going to forward the letter to uh, yeah, the chairpersons and ask them, uh, you know, if this. I think, think we've covered that. But if we're, but if we're, it would seem not to. I'm not being defensive on behalf of the minister. But, <laughs> but you are. I would, oh. say, I would ask whether it makes sense to, to write to the minister just to ask when, when and why you aren't going to brief your committee on the monitoring round when they've done it today. And I'm not, and, and 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 I'm not sure there's any. We, we know that that is out with the guidance or the rules to have done it today, and we don't know whether any other department, whether any other committee hasn't yet had. It would it would seem to be a slap on the wrist, as it were, via letter, when we don't know what other committees have had or haven't had. Chairperson, procedurally, the committee has moved on, has uh, made its agreement and moved on. So, would, in order to rescind the decision, because we have moved on, we would have to consider the subsequent meeting. I'll, allow me to put another person, Clark. Very, I, I appreciate the honourable member from South Belfast attempt to defend his minister. It has been duly noted, but we're moving on. Yeah, to heaven. Yeah, just, just on that, uh, and there is, a, there, is, <laughs> there is an ugly side to that defensive MLAs and committees. I just hear it, I hear it, and I'm never like that. Of course, you know I'm not. But but the guidance is clear. The guidance is clear. That's why you're not a minister, Paul. Uh, yes, I agree. The, the guidance is clear. The, the assembly committees are in full control of their time with regards to this. Yep. And the extent and timing of this engagement, I'll quote, the extent and timing of this engagement is obviously a matter for individual committees and there should be early engagement with committees in order to establish the requirements. We were able to get the presentation from our department, Department of Finance, in, in December. There's no reason why all the departments weren't, shouldn't have been able to make sure that happened in December, especially and, when a committee and just requested. to draw a close on to this, we were responding from correspondence from the chair of, of, of course. that committee, so therefore we do it. Right, moving on. Um, I seek agreement to ask the department to provide details of all COVID-19 related. We've done that. Uh, the committee is content with the forward draft work programme for January to April 2021. Chairperson, small problem. Nilga have just been in contact, indicating they may not be able to brief uh, next week. So, if it's possible, members, uh, they were going to brief on EU structural funds and loss of. Um, so, what's we're coming? Pardon? Was Solas coming? Solas will come with them, but I think we're. I suspect they're both cancelling. 
uh, but I will go back on them and see if I can persuade them to come after all because I know it is very timely. Uh, but if we're stuck and we don't have it, we could take a briefing from Freeze on the building regulations issues that we were talking about earlier. Uh, yes, I'll be content for that. Okay. Good. Thanks, Happy. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, AOB. Good. All uh, right. Uh, the next, just before we go into closed session, uh, the next meeting uh, will be Wednesday, the 20th of January, uh, 1400 here in the Senate Chamber. Uh, just so you're aware, obviously there have been questions raised in the um, business uh, business committee with issues with, particularly with COVID and presence and the amount of time we're spending in the assembly building and bearing in mind we're supposed to be increasingly working from home and the sort of the implications that that is the case so we will keep this under advisement as 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 we go forward but uh one of my concerns has always been about uh starleaf and communications and bearing in mind we had two committees today trying to use starleaf at the same time and i think the uh the response was patchy I'd also like to write a short note of apology to our two um, witnesses who came in, to Hugh and Professor Ainaji, um, for the state of the communications, because I don't think I think it was rather a suboptimal sub uh, witness session compared to what we normally have. Okay, if we're content, then we'll move into closed session, and we need to. Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.